One morning, when I was in my formative years, I had a school test I hadn't revised for. My lack of application to my school work had already been the source of a conversation between me and my dad several weeks before and I knew that my performance in this test would probably earn me another bare-bottomed appointment with him. I decided the best thing to do was pretend to be sick. So when mom came in to see why I hadn't showered or appeared at the breakfast table, I told her I had a bad stomach ache. I was pretty good at hamming it up, and my mother looked at me in a concerned way, though somewhat skeptically. I guess she knew children would be children. I'd better get the thermometer and take your temperature, she said. I had been cute enough to foresee this move on mom's part, and had a plan, thanks to a comic book I had read some time back. Mom came back with the thermometer, stuck it in my mouth, and told me to keep it there while she finished up with something in the kitchen. Now, in this comic I read, a boy simply held the thermometer close to a light bulb in order to artificially raise his temperature, and he got the day off school. Fortunately, this was a dark winter morning so my bedside light was on. I took the thermometer out of my mouth, held it close to the bulb and when I heard my mom's footsteps coming back, I popped it quickly back into my mouth. Unfortunately for me, I didn't have much idea about normal human body temperatures and certainly didn't know when not to overdo things. My mother read the temperature, looked at me more suspiciously still and put her hand to my forehead, then down the shirt of my pajamas. Well, young man, she said ominously, we have a problem here. You have a temperature of 103 and yet you're not in the least bit hot or clammy. Have you been messing about with that thermometer? Compounding my sin, I now denied that too. I'd better go get the baby thermometer, she said. I whined that I was too big a boy to have a thermometer put up my bottom, but mom didn't listen and went to fetch it, along with a jar of Vaseline and a box of tissues. Mom pulled down my sheets and ordered me to flip over onto my stomach. I watched, horrified, as she applied a blob of Vaseline to one end of the thermometer, then pulled down my pajama pants. It had been some time since mom had seen my bottom, especially so intimately all of my spankings were now administered by dad, and had been since I was around eight years old, so it was mortifying to be treated like a baby again. In vain, I hoped mom would leave me to stew and I could whip the thermometer out, heat it and stick it back in my butt before she returned. No such luck. She just sat patiently, gazing thoughtfully at her son's backside. I think she was making plans for it even then. At last she pulled the thermometer out, wiped my bottom with a tissue, and read the result. Normal. I was now in big trouble, as mom quickly spelled out. I had told a lie about feeling sick, and I had most certainly told a lie about interfering with the thermometer. Dad was away on business for a couple of days, so I fully expected this to be stored up for when he returned, but it was a surefire spanking offence. However, the next shock was Mom telling me to keep my pants down right where they were, and that she was going to fetch the paddle. She came back with the wooden paddle my parents had used on me since I was a little boy. Mom ordered me out of bed, more embarrassment, because she now got to see my penis, then sat down on it herself and in short order pulled me over her lap. The spanking I got from her was just as bad as any I had had from dad and the result was one very sore and sorry boy. Of course, I was by now more than late for school and, through my tears, there was at least the hope that mom would deem it not worth me going in now. I was dead wrong. Not only did mom take me into school, but she took me to my classroom, where she apologized to the teacher and explained in front of everyone that I was late, because I had to have a bare bottom spanking for lying about being sick. My shame was complete, and the teasing I received from my classmates went on for weeks. Predictably, that afternoon I also screwed up in the test, so when dad came home a few days later I was taken straight upstairs to be paddled again, and of course he made it an extra hard one to take into account my previous shenanigans. I do sort of feel sorry for today's kids, 
as modern digital thermometers have taken away the possibility of pulling this stunt, even if it did mean risking your butt. When I was a little girl, the discipline I dreaded most was a beating with the cane. My mother used a rattan cane, and it never failed to leave a nasty sting. I would have red lines and raised welts decorating my bare bottom for the next two to three days, and the entire ordeal was very painful. When mum told me that I was going to have the cane, my buttocks would clench up, and I became nervous and afraid. Previous memories of the cane's lasting sting would fill my thoughts and begin to haunt me, even before I had been beaten this time. To receive my punishment, I had to bend over a wooden chair, keep my legs together, and stick my bottom out nicely. With every stroke, I would flinch and squirm. Mum would take her time and pace the canings so that the sting of each stroke settled before the next was administered, and I could really appreciate the searing pain from each whack. Mum had three distinct caning styles. In the most common method, she first held the cane firmly against my buttocks and stalled for a couple seconds. She would then pull the cane back and flick her wrist forcibly. The cane would travel parallel to the floor and end its journey across the width of my bottom. The second style hurt more. Here, mum would raise her hand high and bring the cane down perpendicular to the floor. The cane would come down whistling and slice through my protruding buttocks. I would flinch and grunt in pain with each impact. The last was the most severe. In this method, similar to the previous one, mum would raise her hand and lash the cane down swiftly on my flesh. But the swing here was at a 45 degree angle to the floor. Furthermore, the target area was the far edge of my buttock. In fact, the cane landed just below my hip and on the outer side of my thigh. These canings were always given on my right side, as mum was right hand. Trust me, canings along the width of the buttocks hurt plenty, but the ones landing right below the hip, where the buttock cheek ends and the outer side of the thigh begins, are excruciatingly painful. I lived through these canings. My mother was certainly very strict, but it helped keep me in line and mold me into the person she wanted me to be. I am a strict mother myself, and use a rattan cane to discipline my son. And yes, I do cane him in all the three ways my mum caned me. I honestly cannot remember what I had in mind that fateful morning. In fact, I cannot even remember what chore made me fake an illness. Was it school that I wanted to avoid? A visit to a boring relative? Some family outing? Whatever it was, I complained of headache and tiredness. My mother had a simple criterion for missing school. If a sick child had a fever, defined as a temperature of at least 38 C, he or she would miss, otherwise, not, or he or she had to be pretty convincing, or have an unmistakable symptom such as diarrhea. Furthermore, complaints of tiredness and headache, indicating a possible bout of influenza or similar viral infection, always warranted a temperature check. Mother felt my brow with her hand, frowned and sent me to my room, saying she would bring me the thermometer. I knew the routine. I got in bed. Mom came, put a bottle of medical alcohol and some cotton on the bedside table, pulled the thermometer out of its case, checked that the indicated temperature was below 36 C, otherwise, she would vigorously wave it to push the mercury down, and handed it to me. I did what was expected of me, I took the thermometer, pulled it under the bed sheets, rolled on my side and stuck it in my anus. At this point, I should mention that when I was growing up, 1970s and early 80s, it was very common for French adults to take their temperature rectally. This was the method of choice in hospital, and also in our home, for mother had read some family medical books that said other methods were somewhat unreliable. Thus, Whereas in the US a child would graduate from having his or her temperature taken rectally by a caregiver to oral temperatures, a French child would often, once old enough, be asked to insert the thermometer by himself or herself under bed linen. Mom departed. I was then stuck with a difficulty. If my temperature was too low, I would be deemed fit enough for whatever I was trying to avoid. 
Fortunately, I had had an idea that I thought was very clever. Little did I know that this neat trick I had in mind was cliché and was even featured in popular fiction. I took the thermometer out of my behind, turned on my bedside lamp and began heating it. Mother normally did not return before three minutes had elapsed, the thermometer was supposed to be accurate after one minute, but she counted three to be sure. This time, for some reason, perhaps she had suspicions about my demeanor, she returned early. I nearly jumped out of bed as she opened the door. I had no plausible explanation why I was not lying in bed with the thermometer in my behind. Instead, I was sitting on the bed, thermometer in hand and had hastily turned my lamp off. I don't actually recall what kind of fake excuse I tried using maybe I said I was trying to read the thermometer using the lamp. To my surprise, mother stormed off, telling me to stay there. She soon returned and told me to get out of bed. She took the thermometer out of my hand and once more shook it down. Then she sat DPWM on the bed and ordered me to drop my pajamas and lie across her lap. At this point, I realized she also had a tube of Vaseline and some toilet paper in her hand. When she had us take our own temperatures, mother did not provide lubricant, probably reasoning that one would not inflict harm on oneself and that cleaning Vaseline off our bottoms was annoying. However, when she did the honors, as was still happening with my little brother, she used Vaseline. I gulped when I realized she intended to take my temperature the little child way, and worse, in the position she used for spankings. What could I do? I went across her lap. Mother prepared the thermometer, parted my buttocks, and told me to push. This was her signal that I was to bear down as if going potty, to ease the introduction of the thermometer into my anus. I was used to it, since mother was still giving me suppositories herself, for some reason I was considered old enough to take my own temperature, but not to take suppositories, and immediately complied. The greasy rod entered me. Mother counted three minutes, then, with a dry and ironic tone, remarked that it was surprising that I had a normal temperature whereas I was supposed to be feverish, and given the temperature shown by the thermometer when she walked on me. Maybe I had an explanation. I don't recall what I tried to answer. Probably nothing, for the case was so obvious that fake excuses would have done me no good. Mother then proceeded to spank me, while chiding me for misbehaving. I had committed several offences. I had tried to cheat, then lied about it, and I had also risked damaging a mercury thermometer, which would have been both dangerous and difficult to clean up. Furthermore, these lies were about health, which she considered an important issue and not one for play. While mother definitely had a liking for spanking on our bare bottoms, most of the time, she did not spank long or hard, counting on embarrassment more than on physical pain for deterrence of future misbehavior. Unfortunately for me, this time she considered the problem serious enough to warrant a long and hard smacking. I was probably lucky that unlike her older sister, as I had heard from my cousins, my mother did not use a spanking implement even for severe cases, and was thus the severity of the punishment was limited by the resilience of the palm of her hands. These must have stung, however, for she gave it to me long and hard, and I soon could not prevent myself from utterances of pain and humiliation. My sister, whose bedroom was next to mine, told me later that she had listened to my chastisement. Finally, mother considered I had had enough or, at least, perhaps that her palm had had enough. She wiped my anus and between my buttocks. I did not dare protest the slight intrusion of her paper-clothed finger and told me to get up. She told me to get dressed as she cleaned the thermometer with alcohol, put it back into its case and left the room. I recall that, during a later sickness, a real one this time, I feared mother would take my temperature this way again. Fortunately, I was back to the regular way. Perhaps she had forgotten, or perhaps she considered that spanking had been a sufficient deterrent against future cheating. It must be remembered that in Britain in the 1950s, Corporal punishment was widely used to discipline children. 
This discipline was carried out on boys and girls alike, both in the home and at school. I well remember when I was younger visiting a friend of my mother. I was sent to the playroom with her friend's daughter, Emily. After some naughtiness, Emily's mother arrived and announced that she would have to be punished. My mother thought that as I was involved I should be included in the punishment. Her friend replied that she didn't like to punish somebody else's child, but if mother assisted with Emily's punishment, she would return the favor. Emily's mother produced a small, thin cane from behind the toy cupboard while my mother held Emily's hands behind her back and bent her over a table. I felt trepidation about what was to happen to me. Emily's mother gave her three sharp, stinging strokes, then it was my turn. My mother was handed the cane and told to hit quite hard, as I was wearing thick trousers. In spite of this protection and my mother's inexperience, I was soon joining Emily in tears. My mother later acquired a cane and used it on me from time to time. It must be remembered that in Britain in the 1950s, corporal punishment was widely used to discipline children. This discipline was carried out on boys and girls alike, both in the home and at school. I well remember when I was younger visiting a friend of my mother. I was sent to the playroom with her friend's daughter, Emily. After some naughtiness, Emily's mother arrived and announced that she would have to be punished. My mother thought that as I was involved I should be included in the punishment. Her friend replied that she didn't like to punish somebody else's child, but if mother assisted with Emily's punishment, she would return the favor. Emily's mother produced a small, thin cane from behind the toy cupboard while my mother held Emily's hands behind her back and bent her over a table. I felt trepidation about what was to happen to me. Emily's mother gave her three sharp, stinging strokes, then it was my turn. My mother was handed the cane and told to hit quite hard, as I was wearing thick trousers. In spite of this protection and my mother's inexperience, I was soon joining Emily in tears. My mother later acquired a cane and used it on me from time to time. I grew up in the 1970s and early 1980s in Northern England, in a predominantly working-class city. My father worked on the docks, and my mother essentially raised us. I was the middle of three girls my elder sister, Vanessa, is two years my senior, while Zoe is two years younger than me. Spanking was the normal form of punishment for children back then, and both my siblings and I were often punished in front of one another for various reasons. It was always mum who delivered the spankings, there was never any of this wait till your father gets home nonsense. Even if dad was home, he firmly believed that disciplining the children was mother's work. Most of these spankings were spontaneous and usually just involved mum's hand. This is an account of the worst spanking I ever got. A friend and I had been caught shoplifting makeup from a very well-established store in the town centre. We were detained in the manager's office and our parents were called. My own mum arrived first. She was obviously livid and did something she had never done before she slapped my face in front of both the manager and my friend. Mum also assured the manager that I would be getting a good hiding when I got home, and on that basis, the manager agreed not to pursue the matter any further. When we got home, I was told to go straight up to the bedroom I shared with my younger sister Mum said she would be up in a few minutes to deal with me. I remember it was a Saturday, as my dad was in and watching Grandstand, the sports roundup television program on the BBC. Dad didn't say anything to me, but his face registered extreme disappointment in my behaviour. After a few minutes, Mum came in to see me. She told me to place myself right over on the bed. Once I was in position, the spanking started in earnest, and she was smacking my bottom as hard as she could. The spanking really stung and seemed to last forever. It was certainly a prolonged punishment, and I remember gritting my teeth and squeezing a pillow whilst crying my eyes out. When it was finally over, I was told I was grounded for a month with no pocket money. Furthermore, Mum told me, if I was ever caught stealing again, 
She would use the belt this wasn't the last time I was spanked, but it was certainly the most memorable. When I started at school, up till second grade mild forms of corporal punishment were still allowed. If you misbehaved enough, you were sent to the principal if you were a boy, or his wife if you were a girl. They would both give you a hand spanking on the seat. This practice stopped in the third grade. From then on, for any misbehavior, you got a note sent home for your parents to sign or a phone call was made to them. My parents took behavior in school very seriously, so any notes about even small misdemeanors would earn me a spanking. These would always be administered by my father. Mother would read the note I brought from school, scold me and then send me to my room to do my homework and wait for dad to come home. Once he returned, mom would inform him of the note and he would come up to my room to deal with me. First, he would talk to me about my misbehavior. I was given a Christian upbringing, so father would say things like to misbehave at school was the same as misbehaving for mother and father. To misbehave for your parents was the same as misbehaving for God. Then he would ask, what happens when you misbehave? And I would have to reply, I get spanked. After the talk, dad would put me over his knee for the spanking itself. Again, because of their strong Christian beliefs. I think dad didn't believe it was okay for him to see my bare bottom. Only my mom, grandma and the moms of a couple of friends ever spanked me with my panties down. Dad only ever spanked me on the seat of my pants, but believe me, he even threw clothing he could spank hard enough for me to cry both during the spanking and for a long time afterwards. I would normally get double my age in smacks from dad. After the spanking, dad would hug me and tell me that he and mom loved me even when I misbehaved and was being spanked. Then he would leave the room and let me finish crying. I had to stay there until dinner, and sometimes it was hard to sit during the meal because my bottom was still so sore. My middle son was naughtier than both of his brothers put together, and unfortunately this meant that he did regularly find himself with a sore bottom. Right up until he was seven, he went through some dreadful toddler-like temper tantrums. He would throw himself on the ground, scream, flail his limbs about and generally act like a much younger child. On the whole, the best way to deal with this attention-seeking behavior was to actually just completely ignore it until he got fed up and realized he wasn't getting a reaction. After a few minutes, he would give up and start behaving normally again. We would then reward his improved behavior with our attention and praise. However, there were occasions where this simply was not possible and his tantrums did earn him a smacked bottom. One such occasion was unfortunately on the day of his sixth birthday. We had taken Harry, his brothers, cousins and several of his little school friends to a large indoor soft play area, where we had hired a section for his party. All in all, my wife, myself and two other parents we had roped into being party helpers were responsible for 18 young children, all of whom were hyper with sugar and excitement. Things were chaotic, but manageable. And then I heard it the unmistakable sound of my son screaming and shouting. Get out. It's mine. I heard him yell, face red and fists balled up in rage. I rushed over to see him angrily shouting at another pair of children, who had evidently been attending the wider soft play area, and had accidentally wandered into our private party section. For heaven's sake, Harry. I said crossly, feeling mortified by my son's conduct, as the other children's flustered mother came over to remove them. I was shamefaced as I apologized, feeling furious at my son's apparent selfishness and inability to share. I took his arm and led him over to a quieter area, giving him a chance to calm down as I told him off for being so selfish and rude. With a quick glance around to ensure no do-gooders were there to interfere, I gave him a very firm smack to the back of his leg. Behave yourself, or you will be getting a proper smack, Harry. I warned him, as we walked back to his party. Harry did heed my warning for a while, but then we cut his birthday cake, and he again started misbehaving. One or two kids 
who were not with our group had obviously decided to try their luck by joining the rush for cake and as Harry saw them walking away from the table, holding paper plates containing his cake, he again lost his temper. Give that back, he screamed at them, so loudly and angrily that it caused a momentary hush in the soft play area, which is quite a feat, as I'm sure anyone who has ever attended one can confirm. Of course, we allowed the shell-shocked children to keep the cake, and they rushed away. Meanwhile, my wife tried to calm Harry down, but it was too late. He threw himself on the floor and started screaming and kicking his limbs angrily, clearly enraged by the unfairness of being made to share. I felt mortified and furious. I strode over, grabbed both of his little flailing arms and began to lead him towards the toilet. My wife started to speak in Harry's defense, clearly realizing from my demeanor that I intended to him, but I cut her off short, no, Polly I don't care what day it is, he's already been warned. The way he has been behaving is absolutely unacceptable. I tightened my grip on Harry's upper arms and dragged him, still screaming, towards the toilets. Making sure to select an individual baby changing room for privacy, I firmly pushed Harry through the door and locked it behind us. I placed him on the padded nappy changing table and waited until his tantrum died down. Eventually he tired himself out, stopped kicking and screaming and just lay there for a few minutes, crying quietly. When I felt my son was actually calm enough to actually listen, I lifted him from the changing table and stood him on the ground in front of me. I began to tell him off for the way he had behaved, his selfishness and his immaturity. Even though he must have seen how angry I was, I think he believed I would not give him a spanking on his birthday. He was wrong. He started to protest in shock and fear as I lifted him from the ground, sat back down on the plastic chair and lowered his trousers and pants. No daddy, he continued to beg, as I laid him face down across my lap and began smacking his bottom. I gave him twelve hard smacks in total, turning both cheeks of his bottom a deep pink color. I felt confident that his loud crying and the sound of the spanking would be lost amongst the general racket of the soft play area. When Harry eventually stopped crying, I stood him in front of me and raised his underwear and trousers. I knelt down to his level and firmly gripped his upper arms. Are you going to have any more tantrums, Harry? I asked. He quickly and desperately replied that he would not. I looked at his face seriously for a moment, to show him I meant business, then picked him up and cuddled his small body against mine. He clung on like a little monkey, as I hugged him for a few seconds, then we rejoined the party. I am glad to say that Harry's sore bottom did the trick, and he enjoyed the rest of his day. He even behaved well and sat nicely when we went to Pizza Hut afterwards for his birthday tea. That evening, when the boys were all in bed, Polly asked me if I had in fact smacked Harry's bottom earlier. Of course she already knew full well that I had, she was fishing for the details. Indulging her curiosity, I recounted the incident in the baby changing room, as she shook her head sadly and tutted. She sighed deeply. Oh, that naughty little boy, she muttered, as we turned our attention back to the television. At the end of the program, Polly yawned loudly. I'm knackered after today fancy an early night, she suggested, trying to hide the glint in her eye. Not wanting to miss out on her good mood, I quickly agreed and we soon headed upstairs to our bedroom. This story is true and written from personal experience. What I set down now is exactly how everything unfolded in 1973, at a time when the phenomenon of streaking began to be popular. I was living on Long Island in a small town. I was in my latter formative years, and nearing the start of high school, in my freshman year, after completing junior high, what is now called middle school. It was summertime, and me and my friends, two girls and two boys, were hanging out at what was to be our new school in only two weeks' time. We rode our bikes to its sports track and sat in the bleachers looking out at the track, empty of runners, and the road that bordered the field. 
We talked about the prospect of the summer's end, beginning school, how we'd be in class and the teachers would have the same ones who had taught our brothers and sisters before us. So we knew which ones were good and which were bad. Then I changed the subject. I'd become fascinated by the stories appearing in the paper about streaking, and we began talking about the college campuses where those early streakers had made their mark, boldly bearing it all, so naughty in their nudity, wearing nothing but a pair of sneakers. People cheering them on their way, the women's breasts bobbing and the men's cocks jiggling free of their briefs, naked as the day they were born. One of us should christen the track and go streaking, I said. Anyone up for that? Not me. No way. Steve replied. Me neither, added Jimmy. Girls? How about it? I don't think so, Adam. It wouldn't feel right, being naked outside, where anyone driving by could see me. I don't think it would be a good thing to do. It could be fun, I guess. Don't even ask me, Adam, Mary interjected. I'd have to be pretty shameless to do something like that. My mom told me those streakers should be ashamed of themselves, and I agree with her. Then Steve said, Since you're so fired up about streaking, Adam, why don't you do it yourself? Well, I don't know, I replied. Maybe Mary, oh come on, Adam. Don't you want to? We know you do. I was surprised by this turn of events. I thought that Steve or Jimmy would do the deed, but now they were daring me and I was having second thoughts. Then Carol piped up, goading me on, yeah, Adam, I think you should do it I think it'd be a hoot. There was a side to me developing, because of those newspaper stories, like an obsession. I admired those streakers for their boldness. I thought about nudity in a whole new light. In a way, I knew that all I'd need was a little push, and I'd strip off every stitch of clothing without a second thought. I wasn't ashamed. I felt emboldened and free, and all I could think about was the feel of the sun on my bare skin, running outdoors in the open, bare-ass naked, with a smile on my face and my face getting hot, just the same, with a combination of desire and inhibition. Steve said, Come on, Adam, it'll just be for us. We won't tell a soul about it. That small tingle of modesty, I should have paid a bit more attention, to just seconds, before was replaced by a desire that was there all along. Okay, I said, you can just watch me here I go. I began to unbutton my shorts as Mary looked on in disbelief. I lifted my t-shirt over my head, pulling it off, and dropping it to the ground, next to my bike. Oh, Adam, I can't believe you're going to do this, Mary cried, aren't you embarrassed at all? Stop, please. This just emboldened me even further. I unzipped my shorts and let them fall to my ankles. My hands clasping the waistband of my underpants, and tugged them down, and enjoyed the feel of the cotton slipping across the curve of each, but cheek. Oh, you're really shameless. Mary said. Not at all, Mary I feel great. I replied while bending down to pull my shorts and underpants out of each pant leg, drawing them off each sneaker, then dropping them next to my bike. Oh, Adam, I can't believe you're going to do this, Mary cried, aren't you embarrassed at all? Stop, please. This just emboldened me even further. I unzipped my shorts and let them fall to my ankles. My hands clasping the waistband of my underpants, and tugged them down, and enjoyed the feel of the cotton slipping across the curve of each, but cheek. Oh, you're really shameless. Mary said. Not at all, Mary I feel great. I replied while bending down to pull my shorts and underpants out of each pant leg, drawing them off each sneaker, then dropping them next to my bike. Now, not wearing a stitch except my socks and sneakers, I turned with my backside facing my four friends and took off around the track. As I jogged around, a couple of cars passed, one of them honking its horn at me. Sweat began to form on my back. Then I saw. They had all gone. Their bikes had gone. 
And so had my clothes, apart from my underpants. That's when it hit me like a lightning bolt, Mary had done this to teach me a lesson. My only consolation was that they had at least left me my underpants, so I wouldn't have to ride home completely naked. But it was bad enough. I crept back into the house, which was filled with the scent of cooking. My mother initially had her back to me, stirring something on the stove. She turned around and her jaw dropped. Adam. Where are your clothes? What have you been up to, young man? Answer me. I was frozen in place, at a complete loss for anything to say. I reached down with my hands and covered my crotch. I was a classic picture of embarrassment, and my face was hot with shame. Adam, what happened? I couldn't think of anything to explain, there was nothing to say but the truth, and so that's what I told her. I explained, as best I could, the stories I'd read in the newspaper, and how I'd become fascinated with the idea of streaking. You mean to tell me that people saw you, running around the track, stark naked, my mother asked. They could have recognized you. Everyone in town knows us. If I were you, I'd want to crawl under a rock. You seem way too proud of yourself, and your indecency. Mary took my clothes, and I think Carol left me my underpants. They wanted to teach me a lesson, well, Adam, my mother replied, the lesson, obviously, didn't sink in. She turned around, took the wooden spoon out of the saucepan, turned off the stove and ran the spoon under cold water. Then she threw the spoon onto the kitchen table, walked over to me, and grabbed me by the earlobe. It was done so quickly, I was speechless, standing there, with a sweaty backside. Mother tugged my underpants down to my ankles. So you like being naked in public, showing yourself to the world, Adam. How do you like it now? She gave me a a good, hard smack on my bare bottom, then sat in a kitchen chair and tipped me swiftly across her knees, my bare bottom centered and raised high. She proceeded spank me with her hand, slaps alternating between my sweaty cheeks. Occasionally a sharp slap would catch my anus. I kicked my feet and sent my underpants flying across the kitchen floor. Please, mom, I'm sorry. I yelled. You should be, you should be ashamed as well. Ow? Yes I'm ashamed, honest. I wailed. My bottom was on fire. After this, she said, picking up the wooden spoon, I hope you will have learned your lesson, and every time you sit down you'll be reminded of the consequences of your misbehavior. And there'll be no dinner for you tonight. Mother tugged my underpants down to my ankles. So you like being naked in public, showing yourself to the world, Adam. How do you like it now? She gave me a a good, hard smack on my bare bottom, then sat in a kitchen chair and tipped me swiftly across her knees, my bare bottom centered and raised high. She proceeded spank me with her hand, slaps alternating between my sweaty cheeks. Occasionally a sharp slap would catch my anus. I kicked my feet and sent my underpants flying across the kitchen floor. Please, mom, I'm sorry. I yelled. You should be, you should be ashamed as well. Ow? Yes I'm ashamed, honest. I wailed. My bottom was on fire. After this, she said, picking up the wooden spoon, I hope you will have learned your lesson, and every time you sit down you'll be reminded of the consequences of your misbehavior. And there'll be no dinner for you tonight. Smack. Three times, with the wooden spoon, stinging each buttock in turn. This punishment is between me and you only. I won't tell your father about your shameless, naughty, indecent, behavior because, if I did, you'd get a second helping from him. The spoon continued to do its work, catching my now swollen anus several more times, but finally she was done. Now, there'll be no more bold, unashamed streaking for you, young man, is that clear? Yes, mom, I stammered. Good. Now go upstairs to your room, and don't come out till tomorrow morning. 
She let me off her lap, and, leaving my underwear on the floor, I ran up the stairs with my head down streaking again in my sneakers and socks. I closed the door of my room and pulled off my sneakers and socks. Then I turned myself around to look at my bottom in the mirror on my door. Each cheek had a round welt from the spoon, and my bottom was as red as a jersey apple. I went to my bed and laid down on my tummy. My mother had never spanked me before this but on that day, I got exactly what I deserved. It was my first and last spanking. Johnny didn't move as he waited for his stepmother to come to the door. From the outside he could hear her footsteps as she got closer. The young boy wanted to run, but the police officer had a firm grip on his shoulder. Good morning MS, I'm Officer Kevin Jarrett, are you this young man's mother? Yes sir, I'm Jana Thompson. Stepmother, Johnny said. Hush, she instructed. Mrs. Thompson, Johnny was caught with a group of boys lighting firecrackers and setting little fires in the woods, the office said. Now, no formal charges have been filed, but the owner has taken out an order to keep the boys off the property. If they go there again, they will be arrested. I understand, she said. I can assure you he won't get in any more trouble. Of course he may not be able to sit down for a week, but he won't cause you any more problems. The officer tipped his hat and flashed a slight grin. That's the way my mother would have handled it too, he said. She must have been a smart lady, Jana said. You have a nice day, and thank you again. With that Jana led Johnny into the house and right into the kitchen. Johnny knew that was bad news. Jana had been married to Johnny's father for about two years, and had taken over much of the disciplining of her young stepson since Johnny's father travelled the country covering sports for a major magazine. Jana was 45 years old, but looked 10 years younger. With flowing blonde hair and a body sculptured body from hours spent in the gym, Jana was still considered to be very hot. The gym wasn't the only place she got a workout these days. For the last eight months or so, she had been using spanking as a method to control Johnny. At first she hesitated since she wasn't his real mother, but as his behavior seemed to go downhill, she convinced Johnny's father to let her give it a try. Jana had used spanking as a method to punish her own daughter up to the time she went away to college, and she was well adjusted. Johnny knew that being led to the kitchen was bad news, since that was the room Jana used carried out his punishments. Young man, I'm very disappointed you, she said. You know we have to leave for the airport to go pick up your sister, and I told you not to get in any trouble. Johnny didn't answer. However, he hated it when Jana called Stephanie his sister. Although, he liked her well enough, he didn't feel a kinship. The little pyro thought for a moment since they had to leave for the airport, he was going to be saved by the bell. However, there was no such luck. While she was finishing up her lecture, Jana reached down A with a quick tug and pulled down his loose-fitting shorts and underwear. Young man step out of those clothes, she ordered. He did as he was told. Jana then took a sit in one of the kitchen chairs and ordered Johnny over her knee. Whack! 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 Jana landed several blows to Johnny's red little bottom. Johnny always cried seconds into his punishment. This time the spanking stopped fairly quickly. All right, Johnny get dressed. Don't look so happy. Young man, we have to get to the airport to get Stephanie. You are still going to do your corner time when we get back. On the way to the airport, Johnny and his stepmother didn't have too much to say during the 30-minute drive to the airport. Jana was just excited her daughter was coming home for the summer. Stephanie had inherited her mother's good looks and was enjoying college to the fullest. There was a drawback, however, she was going to school six hours away, and rarely got home. After parking the car, 
Jana and Johnny raced toward the gate. Since I had to spank that little smart bottom of yours, we are probably late, Jana said. Johnny was mortified. Although nobody heard the, the remark, the little boy thought the entire terminal knew his business. Jana and Johnny arrived at the gate just as the first passengers were getting off. Stephanie's seat was somewhere in the middle of the plane, and it took her a few minutes to get off. Once she arrived at the gate, she raced over to her mother with a big hug. She even embraced Johnny, and unlike the first few times she tried to hug him after becoming his stepsister, he didn't pull away. Hi kiddo, what's going on? Hi, Stephanie. On the way home, Johnny sat in the back so Stephanie and Jana could talk and get caught up on how things had been going since she was last home at Christmas. About halfway home, Johnny began to fidget in the back seat. Boy what's a wrong with you? Stephanie asked with a smile. He probably has a sore little bottom, Jana said. It got spanked right before we came to pick you up. Believe it or not, he almost got arrested for setting off fireworks and trespassing. For a moment, the image sent flashbacks through Stephanie's own mind. She could still see herself in the kitchen over her mother's knee. I'm sorry, sweetie, Stephanie said with a wink. Not as sorry as he was, Jana said. In fact, he still has corner time to do when we get back home. Jana not in front of Janice, he pleaded. Oh yes, dear. You know the rules, after a spanking you go to the corner no matter who is in the house, Janice said. That was enough. Johnny eyes pooled with tears as the thought of being in front of his stepsister was too much for his little mind to think about. But Jana didn't back down. Even after Johnny struggled to help Stephanie bring in her heavy luggage, get the mail and bring the garbage cans in off the curb, his stepmother shattered his plans that his good behavior and attitude would get him off the hook. Johnny, I know what you are trying to do, and I am pleased with your good behavior over the last hour, but it's time to get into the corner. Now, don't make me spanking you again first. Johnny knew he was beat, and for the second time that day, Jana grabbed his shorts and yanked them to the ground. With a firm hand, she led him into one of the corners of the kitchen. Your sister and I are going to make some lunch for us, and when it's ready you may get dressed and join us, but not until. Stephanie tried not to stare too much at her little stepbrother. However, it was physically impossible not to get an occasional glance, as she reached for things in the pantry and an fridge to help her mother make lunch. While Johnny was serving his corner time sentence, Stephanie got permission from Jana to give Johnny a present. Here, sweetie, this is for you. Johnny was like any little boy, he loved presents. He quickly turned around forgetting he was pantless. Stephanie had brought her young stepbrother a t-shirt with her college's name printed on the front and his name on the back. As the little boy grabbed the package he realized, he was showing off more than his bare bottom and quickly turned back toward the corner. Thank you, he managed to say. You're welcome. Johnny, it's okay. You don't have to be embarrassed. I've done lots of corner time in my day, too. Finally, Johnny was let out of the corner and allowed to get dressed. It wasn't the last time he got spanked that summer. He even found himself over Stephanie's knee one time on a night she was babysitting. Thirty-five years ago, I was sent away from Georgia to a New England boarding school in the days when they accepted students as early as eighth grade. Among the day students were Michael Eden cousin of mine who lived nearby with his widowed mother, my aunt Sheila. Since Michael and I were both small for eighth graders, we looked about two years younger and were unathletic in a school that placed an emphasis on sports, we found ourselves somewhat excluded from the rough and tumble clubbiness of high school. This situation along with many common interests and family ties drew us together, and we were quickly inseparable. About two weeks into the semester, Michael got AD on the first math quiz and fretted for the rest of the day, as if he had flunked the final exam. 
At some point, I finally asked. What's big deal, Michael? It's just the weekly quiz. You can easily make it up next week by studying hard. He mumbled something about how he was really going to get it at home and changed the conversation. Since my mother still spanked me once or twice a week and frequently mentioned how her sister used the same methods, my curiosity was instantly aroused. Eager to find out more, I pressed Michael further. But he only put me off with more vague answers. It's nothing, Peter. It's just that my mom has my teachers call her whenever I get anything less than AC and then I get in trouble. Knowing there was more to it than that, I asked him as innocently as I could. What do you care if you can't watch TV tonight or lose this week's allowance? Never mind, Peter, it's no big deal. Let's get back to the Red Sox and their chances this fall. Only after you tell me what happens to you at home when you get bad grades. Come on, Michael, you can tell me. Since when do good friends have secrets? I suppose they don't, but really, it's not anything. I'd just rather not talk about it. All of his Michael's mom's friends seemed to know he was still spanked especially since Aunt Sheila talked about it so openly. Some of Aunt Sheila's friends seemed to go out of the way to embarrass him by asking direct questions about his last spanking. If that weren't enough, there was the demerit chart and slipper his mother hung conspicuously on the kitchen wall again, just like my mother. If any visitor inquired, they always got a detailed explanation. Not that they needed any explanations. One side of the slipper had the words, Michael's slipper, clearly printed in large black letters. Demerit charts linked to a weekly spanking hour seem to have been more common in southern homes before the 60s. On my mother's side of the family, they went back two or three generations. In many ways, the chart was a special monthly calendar with a page for each month. Descending on the left was a long list of chores and behavior covering everything from housework and homework to obedience. Honesty. Timeliness. Neatness. Politeness. Proper language. Quietness. Roughhousing indoors. Behavior after lights out, grades. School behavior, as reported by our teachers. And a miscellaneous category. Along the top margin ran the days of the week. Many a naughty youngster found him or herself getting a paddling in the family room, the backyard, the front porch, the teacher's office, the church basement, or a neighbor's house. And since some often got into more trouble in groups, it was not uncommon for two or three youngsters to find themselves waiting to go over a mother or babysitter's lap one after the other. Things had been a little different for Michael because Aunt Sheila had moved north after marrying a doctor from Boston. In the Northeast, spanking was a somewhat more private matter, and it rarely continued after elementary school. Since Michael's home was an exception in this regard, he certainly didn't want his new, high schoolmates to know he was still spanked. It was hard enough that all of his mom's friends knew, not to mention the neighborhood babysitters. Worst of all, some of his new high school teachers even knew because they were longtime friends of his mom from church or neighborhood groups. Like Michael, I was just as eager to keep my own mother's methods a secret from my high school classmates once I arrived in Massachusetts. Growing up in Georgia, I had long since taken for granted that naughty children of all ages were slippered. It was only after arriving in the Northeast that I began to see just how embarrassing it was really for an eighth or ninth grader to be taken over his mother's knee like a little boy and spanked on his bottom. But back to my discovery about Michael. Once we got over the initial embarrassment of admitting we were still spanked, our mutual confession led to a whole series of whispered discussions after school. We compared notes on spankings we had received. The different methods used by our moms and the prominent role of a demerit chart tied to a regular, weekly spanking time. We also swapped stories about our most embarrassing spankings, such as the times 
when we were punished in the living room with family friends present or the spankings received from babysitters. Like my mother, Aunt Sheila believed an extra witness or a surrogate disciplinarian added to the humiliation of a paddling. Over the years, many of my mother's closest female friends had witnessed my spankings, including neighbors and school teachers, as well as cousins and playmates. While Michael and I had both been spanked by babysitters, no one else had ever spanked him. Consequently, he took a special interest in my accounts of being spanked by the school nurse, Bible school teachers, and even the den mother of my Cub Scout pack. It was, perhaps, no accident that all of these women were good friends of my mother and regular visitors to our home. The more Michael and I talked about spanking, the more fascinated we became. Fortunately for me, my weekly experiences across my mother's lap had ended with my departure for school though mom promised this would change the very day I returned for summer vacation. And for the first few months of the fall semester, I figured I was completely safe as long as I was away at boarding school. In fact, she reminded me of my own mom in many ways, right down to her warm face and loving smile. By late September, I had a crush on Aunt Sheila which only deepened over the next few years. As the fall wore on, I came to develop a new understanding of my mom's methods of punishment. The distance I enjoyed from home and my talks with Michael and Aunt Sheila seemed to put things in a new perspective. While it was clear most boys our age would have been horrified at the idea of regular spankings, this had to remain Michael's, and my secret, it did help to know that my best friend was disciplined the same way. Unfortunately, there was no way Michael could keep his secret in his immediate neighborhood. All of his Michael's mom's friends seemed to know he was still spanked especially since Aunt Sheila talked about it so openly. Some of Aunt Sheila's friends seemed to go out of the way to embarrass him by asking direct questions about his last spanking. If that weren't enough, there was the demerit chart and slipper his mother hung conspicuously on the kitchen wall again, just like my mother. If any visitor inquired, they always got a detailed explanation. Not that they needed any explanations. One side of the slipper had the words, Michael's slipper, clearly printed in large black letters. Demerit charts linked to a weekly spanking hour seem to have been more common in southern homes before the 60s. On my mother's side of the family, they went back two or three generations. In many ways, the chart was a special monthly calendar with a page for each month. Descending on the left was a long list of chores and behavior covering everything from housework and homework to obedience. Honesty. Timeliness. Neatness. Politeness. Proper language. Quietness. Roughhousing indoors. Behavior after lights out, grades. School behavior, as reported by our teachers. And a miscellaneous category. Along the top margin ran the days of the week. Before putting us to bed each night, our moms would mark a plus or a minus on the chart for that day with a number next to every minus for the number of spanked earned. When Sunday came, we fetched the chart and the slipper after dinner so they could tally the spanks earned and enter the number of spanks earned. Attentive visitors to our homes could see exactly how many spanks we had earned the previous two or three weeks, and if they flipped the pages, for other months as well. This tended to generate more embarrassing comments and questions at home. Needless to say, with so many categories for misbehavior, we almost always faced a spanking on Sunday nights. The worst effect of the demerit chart, then was to create, what was basically a permanent spanking sentence that hung over us every week. Even before the sting of one Sunday spanking faded, we both knew the ritual would be repeated in seven days, if not before. And over the years, each Sunday night spanking would revive memories of all the preceding spankings going back years while promising an infinite series of future lessons. Though we got older, the Sunday night ritual created a firm tie to our past and reminded us we were still in some ways treated like little boys. 
With the demerit chart hanging in full view in the kitchen, we were visually reminded of what to expect on Sunday, at least four or five times a day. The more the number of demerits accumulated, the more tortuous the waiting became towards the week's end. With so much free time on Saturday and Sunday, the weekends were always the hardest time for me. On top of that, there was always the added uncertainty of whether or not my mom might have lady friends over for dinner or go out and leave me in the hands of a babysitter charged with administering the Sunday night spanking. No wonder I was often eager to get it over with by the time Sunday dinner finally ended and the last dish was cleaned. Sometimes, if my mom got distracted with something after dinner, the waiting would really get to me. On a number of such occasions, I eventually broke down and went to her myself with chart and slipper in hand to ask for my spanking. Even without the demerit charts and slippers, everyone in my neighborhood seemed to know about my spankings from conversations with my moms and gossip spread by my babysitters. Michael's situation wasn't much different. One reason I was so glad to go away to boarding school was that I would finally be at a school where no teachers knew I was still spanked. It was bad enough in elementary school to have teachers tell me I deserved a good spanking for something I had done and then listen while they called my mother to make sure I got one later that day. Despite such embarrassing routines, Michael and I accepted our punishments because our mothers always spanked out of love and made that clear whenever they put one of us over their laps. According to Michael, Aunt Sheila never spanked hastily or in anger and never without a good reason. If she felt his correction couldn't wait until Sunday night, she informed him in a firm tone that he had earned an extra bedtime chat and left it at that. Michael knew he would be put to bed early on those nights and that his mother expected him to take his evening bath directly after doing the dinner dishes. Despite ten years of such bedtime chats with his mother, Michael almost always got butterflies in his stomach while taking his bath. After drying off and brushing his teeth, he reported to his room wrapped in a towel. By then, Aunt Sheila was always sitting on his bed with his special naughty boy jammies laid out beside her, the jammies he always wore on Sunday nights. This was a light blue, one-piece, sleeper outfit his mom had purchased at J. C. Penny with enclosed feet and a button-down flap in back. Except for its size, it was identical to the kind of thing they had worn as toddlers. Apparently, Aunt Sheila believed spankings were more effective if they came with additional reminders of what happened to little boys who didn't act their age. For the same reason, she usually took his temperature rectally after she changed him into his jammies and before his spanking. Michael absolutely hated this since it really made him feel like a toddler. Aunt Sheila always scolded him thoroughly for needing to be treated like a little baby. To make matters worse, she always insisted that his babysitters put him into his naughty boy jammies right after dinner as a reminder of what to expect if he misbehaved. And she always left the Vaseline jar and thermometer out on the bathroom sink in case the babysitter needed it. At some level of his awareness, Carlton knew that he dreaming yet the dream, which was a reenactment of a critical situation in his recent existence, still felt vividly compelling. He was on the bridge of his Starfleet medical rescue craft, approaching the isolated mining settlement on the largely uninhabited continent of Zukov, just inside Vladivost's North Polar Zone. The spacecraft was slowing down as he had ordered, while he was in audio subspace contact with Starbase 17. We haven't much time, Carlton informed Commodore Lavinia Treadwell, the Starbase acting commander at the time. We'll have to start treating those Calvron exposed settlers within 32 minutes at the latest, or it will be too late. 30 minutes now, Commander, Ensign Yolanda Lansford stated softly, while standing behind his bridge command chair, based on their report of when the Kelvron deposit was exposed by the landslide. The purification drones, Carlton asked the Commodore pointedly, when will they reach the surface? He and his medical team were wearing standard radiation-proof armor, but it was only 15% effective against the overpoweringly deadly emanations from pure Kelvron. 
Engineering doesn't know, Commodore Treadwell's voice explained, sounding intermittent and faint, because ionic interference is scrambling the telemetry from the drones, and it may be affecting the guidance systems too. The drones were launched as soon as they were programmed and equipped to neutralize Kelvron radiation, but that took some time, I'm afraid. The interference is affecting our communications also, sir, Ensign Lansford interjected, we could lose contact at any time. Damn. Carlton stood up, his body shaking with barely controlled frustration, and realized that a critical decision was imminent. We're approaching the point to begin our planetary descent, sir, announced Petty Officer Landon Bokken, the ship's helmsman. Stand by, Commander, Commodore Treadwell's static disrupted voice ordered, we're patching Admiral McMichael through, from the surface. Rebecca, normally Starbase 17's commanding officer, was then temporarily on detached duty. She was representing Starfleet, at a psychological conference being held in the Vladivostian Cultural Center of Montgomery. Acknowledged, Mern thank you. Carlton was about to risk his life, so he appreciated a last moment of conversation with his beloved wife. Carlton, sweetheart, don't do anything rash yet, understand me. Although heavily disrupted by ion-induced static, Rebecca's voice was clearly recognizable. Rebecca honey, if I don't make it back, he began, but she interrupted sharply. Just wait, please. If I can just get some technical information for you, there may be time enough, her voice was engulfed in a loud burst of sizzling static. It'll take eight minutes to get to the surface, sir, Ensign Lansford told Carlton. Every minute means additional radiation damage for the settlers down there. Our shielding armor should keep us safe, shouldn't it? Before Carlton could answer, truthfully or evasively, Rebecca's subspace carried voice briefly penetrated the ionic interference. Darling, hold up. The PU. The static crescendoed at that point, drowning out any further communication. Holding position above the mining area, Petty Officer Bokken stated curtly. Commander Kristen. Ensign Lansford's voice held an urgent undertone. At that point, the dream diverged from the actual chronology of Carlton's incredibly altered life. As he struggled to voice a decision, even knowing already what that decision would be and that he would be undertaking a potentially life-threatening sacrifice, Carlton felt a sudden incessant itching on the surface of his hindquarters. He wondered if the sensation was meant as a foreshadowing of the childish, chastisements that his impending action would ultimately result in him undergoing for that sensation hadn't happened in the real-life situation that his dream had, until that point, perfectly reenacted. Carlton reached back towards his buttocks, intending to remove his protective armor's lower body section in order to scratch his intensely itching posterior, when he realized that his two medical crewmates were staring quizzically at him while awaiting his orders. Certainly, he couldn't begin clawing his fingernails into the irritably tingling flesh of his ass cheeks in front of his military subordinates, yet his hands continued to steadily move backward and downward. Carl Ty dear, don't do that. Rebecca's voice was clear and static-free. Drowsily awakening from his slumber, Carlton became cognizant that his body was that of a five-year-old boy rather than a Starfleet officer, and that his wife turned guardian's hands were gripping his wrists tightly. Daadu Yut, Rebecca, ah, uh, mommy. He also realized that the annoyingly sharp itching sensation was still centered on his boyish behind, and that he had rolled onto his stomach while reaching back to scratch his prickling hot, flannel covered fanny. Don't try to scratch your buns, even though they're itching intensely, Rebecca told her recently rejuved new ward. The nanolotion's just been activated, and the quick healing chemistry produces a strong itching effect, but your bottom's too sore for you to scratch it without risking damage to your skin. But it's so irritating, Carlton whined plaintively, it just itches so much. Sit up, sweetie, his wife a guardian told him gently, picking up a cup of lukewarm liquid from his bedstand. This herbal tea will help you, so drink it all down. What's in it? He slowly sat up, his hips squirming with discomfort. It's distilled from a native plant, 
she explained, carefully handing him the cup. Use both hands, please. Native Vladivostok plant. Carlton's small hands encircled the cup, and he began to sip the moderately heated tea, it tasted slightly tart, with a tangerine flavor. It's brewed from Cyberut, which is grown mostly on the Mies Plateau, and it has two almost immediate results it partially numbs sensory effects, especially on the drinker's skin, and it's also strongly soporific. Rebecca sat down on the edge of the junior bed. Carlton finished gulping down the pleasant-tasting drink, then put the cup back on his stand. It would be interesting to analyze the plant's biochemistry, he mused, to see what enzymes it secretes to produce those effects on humans. To his surprise, Rebecca began to laugh lightly while regarding him wryly. What's so damned funny about that idea? Carlton demanded, feeling confused. Language, young man. She shook her finger playfully at him. That's one of the behavior rules, by the way, that you'll be receiving tomorrow, but I won't punish you ex post facto for it now. She smiled affectionately. Don't be offended, honey, but it's rather amusing to hear a five-year-old boy proposing biochemical analysis of his drink, rather than just reacting to its taste. She tenderly ruffled his soft blonde hair. Well, I'm still a medical officer, Carlton responded, in my own inner perception, anyway. But you're physically a young child, Rebecca reminded him, pretty much emotionally, too. She gently guided his boyish body into a prone position on the bed, then pulled the bed covers over him as Carlton laid his head on the plumped-up pillow. Thanks, mommy it feels better already. The itching sensation upon his recently strapped rump had diminished to a slight tingling, and he began drifting into slumber. Sleep tight, darling boy, his new guardian murmured quietly, tomorrow's going to be a humbling, bottom-blazing experience for you, as your one-time daughters planned it. Carlton did rest peacefully from that point on, until he was abruptly awakened by his new big sister nine hours later. Kaltai, it's time to rise and shine, Nan Tessa announced in a sing-song voice, gently shaking his shoulders. Your bottoms are going to rise after every swat from my paddle, and they'll be shining a candy apple red by the time I'm finished smacking them. Oh, Nanny, he drowsily sat up, feeling somewhat confused, then noticed that she was gripping the rounded handle of a rectangular-headed poplar paddle in her right hand its smooth striking surface was almost 6x4 in size, with rounded edges, and it was 3 eighths of an inch thick. The ash blonde would had some scarlet lettering on its surface, but Carlton couldn't read it clearly with his blurry focusing vision. Time for your wake-up paddling, little boy. She slapped the paddle sharply against her left palm whop. This is the start of a new family tradition with my new baby brother, so let's get your chubby bottom cheeks for your first morning paddywhacking from me. She tittered cheerily. But hardly your last, that's for certain. Oh, but Nanny, I'm so sore from yesterday, but even as he finished the statement, he realized that it wasn't true his posterior didn't feel even moderately tender, beyond the normal sensitivity of a five-year-old's behind. Tell me another one, Carl Tai, Nan Tessa scoffed condescendingly, sitting on the side of his low bed, she seated herself almost exactly where her mother had done likewise the night before, immediately prior to strapping Carlton's boyish behind. Just lie across my lap right now, and let's see how sore you're dishonest you really are. Carlton started to protest, but he quickly realized that it would have the same effect with Nan Tessa that it had always had with Rebecca, his spanking would simply be extended and intensified. But, oh, yes, Miss Nan Tessa. Quickly, naughty brother. Nan Tessa set the paddle down behind her. Leaning forward, he got onto his hands and knees then awkwardly crawled onto his big sister's lap. She settled him into optimal punishmentary sieving position, just as she'd observed her mother do dozens of times, when he'd still been her father, sliding his torso forward by right-handly pressing his derriere upward while pushing his head downward with her left hand. Feeling highly vulnerable with his backside upturned and aware that he was facing an imminent paddling, Carlton struggled to fight back childish sobs. 
Once his sleeper's seat flap was unbuttoned and lowered by his girlish disciplinarian, the cool air making his plump exposed buttocks shiver, he couldn't hold them back any longer. Ah, wahoo, ahoo, tears began to form in the corners of his eyes, as his five-year-old body again betrayed his adult consciousness. Don't cry, Carl tied not yet, anyway because I've got good news. Nantessa reached back with her right hand, picking up the wooden paddle. She gently pressed the paddle's smooth striking surface against the base of his posterior. Don't worry, they'll be back to bright glowing red long before I'm finished paddling them, baby boy. Before we start, would you like to read this spanking paddle's inscription, Carl Tai? Momentarily shifting the chastisement implement to her left hand, Nan Tessa leaned leftward to hold its smooth varnished top in front of her sibling Spanky's face. Through all red tearing eyes Carlton focused his vision on the thick scarlet lettering Sibling Seat Sizzler, for applying sound sisterly spankings, T.O. Baby Brotherly Bum Cheeks. Vu very are literative, he stammered, thinking about the other side of the solid-looking paddle, the surface, that would be blisteringly visiting and revisiting his elevated naked ass cheeks. I thought you'd appreciate it, naughty child. Sitting up straight and encircling Carlton's waist with her left arm, after shifting the paddle back to her right hand, Nantessa eagerly lifted the solid paddle high over her shoulder, her own blue teal globes pressed down against the bed as she took chastising aim at Carlton's inviting the framed, quivering round butt cheeks. Now you can bore for real, brother dear. Then she swung the paddle downward, forcefully and accurately, and continued to do so for what her brother felt was almost an eternity. Smack. Whack. Crack. Smack. Whop. Smack. Crack. Whack. As Carlton vainly twisted his hips and kicked his legs, Nantessa cheerfully walloped his plump, rapidly reddening rear end with her specialty ordered, penetrators rated wooden paddle. As she alternated from one blazing buttock to another, focusing her stinging swats on his sensitive undercheek areas, her young sibling's wails merged into one continuing long, childish, wahaha, while his upturned naked nether cheeks bounced merrily with every resounding smack of the hardwood impacting against them. Grinning girlishly, Nantessa wished that the woodshed session would never end, which is exactly how it seemed to her babyishly blubbering new little brother. Sleeping meant flashback dreams and awakening meant wake-up sessions with Nanny's rump plastering paddle for the foreseeable future, Carlton realized dimly while his tears continued flowing. From a mother's point of view, discipline matters. I learned early on that to be too lenient with children does not pay off. Being a stay-at-home mom with four kids, I ran a tight ship. Once the girls were older they were generally better behaved, but the boys had to learn that mom meant business. What is more, when they came back from visiting their father, they were particularly unruly, no wonder, as he spoiled them rotten. I particularly remember a time when both boys were taken over my knee to have the wooden spoon. They were told repeatedly that drawing on the walls is unacceptable, no matter how artistic they might be feeling. Both boys are quite gifted and I think their high intelligence was partly the reason they were so mischievous when they were little, they got bored too easily for their own good. Anyway, on this particular occasion, I was helping my eldest daughter Chrissy with her homework. I noticed the boys were being awfully quiet, so I asked my other daughter, Steffi, to go check on them. Presently, a gasp came from the other room and Steffi yelled, Mom! They are drawing on the wall, in Cren! I saw red and went to see what was happening. When I got there, Steffi was standing there with her hands on her hips, mimicking my own pose when the children were naughty, and two very guilty-looking little boys. They had crayon all over their hands, arms, faces and white t-shirts, and they were sweaty and sorry-looking. On the wall next to them was a magical castle, horses, and two knights having a sword fight. It actually didn't look half bad, and I had to check myself to be strict with them. Sorry, mommy, Chris began, his lower lip already quivering with fear at the consequences of what he had just done. His brother Stephen just stood there looking at the floor. He always took longer to become contrite, and he was also usually the mastermind behind naughtiness. Steffi, get the spanking spoon. I barked. She rushed off purposefully to get it. Meanwhile, Chrissy appeared at the door, not wanting to miss the fun. 
Chris began to whimper while Stephen just looked down at the carpet. I sat down on the boy's bed. Get over here. I ordered. They hesitantly moved closer. They knew they had to obey mommy as much as they didn't want to. Stephie came back with the naughty spoon. After taking it from her, I grabbed Chris, pulled down his pants and undies, and over my knee he went. He was already crying before I went to work. I gave him an initial dozen and then told the girls, go get the chairs. They knew what I meant and soon returned with two wooden stools. I had learned that the most effective way to spank the twins was for them to take turns across mommy's lap. While one was spanked, the other sat on their freshly spanked bum. Then they'd switch. At the end, I knew I'd have two well-spanked butts roasting on those chairs. Chris was done with part one now, so I sternly took him off my lap and roughly put his rosy butt on that hard chair. He wailed but didn't dare move I saw the discomfort in his eyes. Stephen went over my lap next, and I started spanking his little bottom without a word. I slapped him hard from the beginning, knowing he was being defiant. Smack, smack, smack. He tried to be brave, but his whimpering gave him away. After a while, he finally began crying, Ow, mommy, I'm sorry. No more. For an answer, I answered back, spanking him on each syllable, Young man, do you decide how much more? No mommy, he wailed, I'm sorry. Satisfied, I lifted him off the stool and sat his sore bottom on the stool next to his brother. While they were sitting there crying, I went and got a bucket of water and two sponges. I was determined that they should clean up their own mess, little as they were. When I thought they had sat on their sore bottoms for long enough, I pointed at the wall with a spanking spoon. You were clever enough to draw on my wall, now be clever enough to clean up after yourselves. Still sobbing from their spankings, they went to work. If I noticed either boy dawdling, they got a new smack on their bare bottom. When they had done, they both got another dose of the naughty spoon, this time a smack for every year of their age. Once they had both been done, they were once again made to sit on their stools and stay there until I called them. Now then, I said finally, don't you ever disobey mommy again, do you understand? Shane and Dale were tough guys. Real tough. You didn't mess with those two. Everyone in Belleville knew that. To begin with, they knew how to use their fists. Shane even knew some savit tricks. Wright and Lartain once learned it at his shin's expense. Since that day, he would never forget to give Shane a wide berth whenever their paths were about to cross again. When asked about Shane, Wright and would shrug his shoulders wave his hand as to chase away a bad memory, and say with a meaningful, unquiet look on his face, this guy is dynamite. Yes, Roland Lartain. You have to consider that Shane, as Dale by the way, was just young, and that Roland had a reputation as someone who could take hard punches as well as deliver them. And saying Shane walking down the street, you just would have seen a rather scrawny looking boy. Just that he wasn't that scrawny. He had the muscles of a stray cat, and he had its nimbleness as well. Dale still had something of a little boy's look. But then it would have been a mistake to just rely on his charming smile. With a slingshot in his hands, Dale was, well, nearly, as accurate and effective as Wilhelm Tell with his crossbow. And he could reload a lot more swiftly. One more thing. Shane and Dale had an encyclopedic knowledge regarding swear words and the wits needed to shoot those right in the bullseye when caught in a verbal argument. They were able to, and already more than once had, shut up the more talkatives of the Halley's markets fishwives or porters. For the time being, it was 14 of July night's dance. Shane and Dale were lying flat on the floorboards, right under the platform on which a band played the musette. They had cut their way through the outer marquee with Dale's pocket knife, and were now carefully hidden behind the raw fabric of the curtain, there were two observation slits, thanks to Dale's knife, between them and the dance floor. And where they were, they had a good view onto the waltzing couples, and especially onto the waltzing girls, whose light summer dresses opened in corollas, showing all kind of interesting details. On the floor, there was a pack of big cobra firecrackers. 
Cobra firecrackers were not to be sold to children, but Shane had ways to get things that weren't to be sold to children. Both boys exchanged a glance. Dale produced a matchbox. He opened it. Peggy and Lillian were both 15, friends since early childhood, and this was their first dance. Peggy didn't notice the red paunchy firecracker that rolled to a stop just between her dancing feet. She was kissing Renee for the first time, and she had closed her eyes. Lillian didn't notice the other cobra at her own feet, because she was listening to Bebert's voice. And this voice was telling sweet words at her ear. The double cracking report was so loud and unexpected that Peggy nearly passed out. Lillian gave a jump, looked around, and saw the curtain under the platform moving. Peggy. Here under the platform. Come on, let's catch the little scoundrels. The accordion had already resumed playing. Both girls plunged under the curtain. Once outside and at a safe distance from the marquee, Shane and Dale stopped and waited. Yes, the moon is high tonight. Here, Shane howled towards the night sky. You boys just wait till we catch you, went Lillian. And then you'll be howling for good, believe me. The night was clear, and lighted by the multicolored bulbs that lined the marquee's angles. So the girls clearly saw Shane's answer, his left hand landed on the base of his right arm, and his right forearm shot upwards. Both boys turned heels and bolted off. And that's when all went wrong. Dale tripped on one of the marquee's guy ropes and fell down. Shane came back to help him up. And suddenly hands were catching their collars. Shane's right foot collided with Lillian's left shin. She let out a yell, but didn't let him go. Instead, she gave him a slap that sent stinging hornets in his right cheek. Dale tried a jab, but only punched into thin air. He then bit hard into Peggy's wrist, who also yelled, but didn't let him go. Instead she caught his right ear and twisted, pulling his head and his sharp kitten's teeth away from her wrist. Facts were cruel, but you had to face them nevertheless, Shane and Dale were outweighed. All they could now from then on was clench their teeth. There, said Lillian. Let's go to Thess Crates and give those boys the spanking of their life. A spanking, yes, that's the idea. Answered a gleeful Peggy. You have no right to spank us. Ventured Shane. Then we'll use our left. And now shut up or else we lead you both back to the dance floor, and instead of a spanking here, just between us, you'll get a very public one. Those words hit home. Here behind the marquee, onlookers hardly were to be feared. And neither Shane nor Dale cared to be seen in such a predicament. Lillian and Peggy sat down, each on her crate. Look at this mess, said Lillian, considering Shane. Scraped knees, a tear in the shorts, half of the shirt's buttons missing. I just cannot figure how boys can be so untidy. I have an idea that your mother won't be happy when she'll see you coming back in such a state. Could be that you earn yourself another spanking then. But let's get down to business. What are you doing? This an alarmed protest from Dale, well, explained Peggy, I'm just tacking down your shorts, you don't dare to do that. It's not fire, this from Shane. We will report you to the police. Yes, yes, you'll tell the police that you got a spanking like the little brats you are, and everyone in town will know all about it. Please, pleaded Dale, why? I don't want to spank your clothes. It's you I want to spank. Both girls had tucked their dresses up to free their thighs. But Shane and Dale were far from being able to appreciate this charming gesture. Besides, they soon were both over those knees, feet dangling in the air, with the pavement a few inches from their nose. You saw them. Well, we saw your bottoms, boys. What did you say? The moon is high. Yours are high indeed. Peggy, don't you find they're cute? Lillian gently tapped Shane's rear. 
Yes, you're right, Lillian. What lovely little buns. Maybe a shade too pale. Shouldn't we warm them up? You know what? It's fun. Oh, look. Over there. The fireworks. Le Fou d'Artifice. It's beginning. A flower of red, yellow and green fire went blossoming high over the square, followed seconds later by the report's clap. Let's shoot a few d'artifices!" exclaimed Lillian cheerfully. Both girls lifted their right hand up. Both hands went down together in a double resounding smack. And now both hands tingled pleasantly. The hands went up again. I never would have believed that a sparking could be that fun. Now Peggy, how could you have known? It's the first time you play the right part. Let's go and spank the devil out of those boys. There were great flares, rockets, Bengal lights, flowers of brightly colored shooting stars. And for each and every one. Peggy and Lillian thunderously applauded, using just their right hand. Some say, never give it away, that, after having clenched their teeth for a good third of the show, Shane and Dale cried their eyes out and even begged for the spanking to stop. The last time that Dale had wept was four years before, over his mother's knee, the day he had broken his fist's windowpane with his first slingshot. The last time Shane had wept was two years before, over his mother's knee, the first time he had been caught playing truant. And so that night, in Belleville, there were not just one few d'artifice, but three. And not just one bouquet final, but three. One in the cloudless sky over the city. And two over Shane's and Dale's most tender part. And believe me or not, the most flaming one was not the first. Two days after this memorable double spanking, Shane and Dale were at a street corner with their friend Manu. The three of them were leaning against the wall outside the drugstore, where they had just bought licorice whips. Suddenly, Manu whispered, Hey boys. Look. On the other side of the street. Those girls. Let's go and chase them. Manu didn't notice it, but both Shane and Dale winced, and their hands unconsciously went to the seat of their shorts. Forget all about it, man, said Dale with a solemn voice. Yes, said Shane to a bemused Manu. Forget about it. Those girls are, well, they are, dynamite. On the other side of the street, Lillian and Peggy spotted the boys. They waved their hands and flashed a wide, and knowing, smile. Shane and Dale waved back. Well, what else could they do? Please note, we would like to make it very clear. We are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. Please note, we would like to make it very clear. We are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. Hello. My name is Amelia Angelina Rigatoni. And I am Italian. I'm very proud of that fact too. My mom and my dad are both from Sicily. I have long black hair and really dark eyes. I'm kind of on the short side. I'm waiting to develop you know where. It's so hard when you're waiting to do something. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, the reason I am telling you all this is because my mama wants me to keep a log about all the stuff I do and what happens to me when I misbehave. I think her idea is perfectly stupid, but after you get to know my mama you wouldn't argue either. Mama is as she puts it, from the old school. In case you don't understand that it means my mama spanks a lot. And I do mean a lot. 
My dad travels all the time so as mama says she has to be both parents. I don't have any brothers or sisters. I kind of get lonely at times, but mama and I keep each other pretty busy. I am in seventh grade. The name of the school I go to is Our Lady of the Perpetual Paddle. The sisters there are pretty nice. If you do anything bad in that place those nuns know how to make you see the light, as they say. I only just started there so I haven't seen any elite yet. Hey you don't think they mean spanking? Oh boy. I get the feeling I just might be seeing this light thing they are always talking about. Mama told me if I ever get a spanking in school I am going to get another one at home. My best friend, Anna Maria, got a spanking in school already. She didn't get it too bad, but when she got home well I don't have to tell you what happened there. In fact, she still had trouble sitting this morning in class. I know that feeling all too well. Anyway if you have the time I'll tell you what happened yesterday. I just want you to know that I am not happy about this. Mama thinks the embarrassment will make me behave better. I think I will just drop dead and die if any of my friends see this. And if there are any mamas out there don't go doing this to your kids. It is cruel and unusual punishment. Anna Maria and I met at the corner of my street. We were going to go to the mall and check out the boys. Mama thought I was going to the library. I sort of feel guilty about lying to her, but she just won't let me do the stuff I want to do. When we got to the mall we went to the food court and got a soda. She and I were checking out all the boys when out of the corner of my eye I saw my mama. I tried to get under the table or go to the bathroom, but I was busted. Mama came over to the table. She looked me right in the eye and you just would not believe what she said to me. My mama said really loud that I was going to get the spanking of my life when I got home. I just about wanted to go through the floor. All the really cool kids were looking at me. She grabbed me by the hand and sort of dragged me out of the mall. I could see all the kids laughing and saying stuff about me. All I kept thinking about was how I was going to explain this to the kids at school tomorrow. We got out to the car and Mama opened the door. She sort of pushed me into the front seat, but right before she did she smacked my butt a whole lot of times. I just wanted to die right there in the parking lot. She was yelling at me and telling me how she was going to turn me over her knee. Of course the cutest boy in the world was getting out of his mom's car just as my mama was spanking my butt. Gosh, I figured this just can't any worse. I bet he saw the whole thing too. When we got back to our house mama made me go stand in the corner. Have you ever heard of anything that ridiculous in your life? She made me stand there for just about forever. Eventually she let me come to her. When I turned around I saw Mama had pulled a kitchen chair into the living room. I knew I was in deep trouble. She made me stand in front of her while she lectured me about the evils of lying and going to hell and all that stuff. I tried really hard not to roll my eyes at her but I guess they have a mind of their own. All of the sudden Mama landed a great big whack on the seat of my panties. Man oh man that hurt. I said to myself that she wasn't going to make me cry this time. I was wrong. Man I was wrong. When she was done lecturing she told me to lift up my uniform. I looked at her with tears in my eyes. She told me when I act like a grown up I'll get treated like one. Gee I hope she remembers this when I'm 16. I glared at her but I stopped dead when she lifted that mean old hairbrush she just loves to spank with. I did as she asked, but I was begging and pleading the whole time. I swear that woman is deaf as can be when I'm begging not to be spank. She made me go over her knee. Gosh I felt like such a child. I just could not believe that I was going to get spanked like a child. Mama spanked my bottom with her hand for a while. I was kicking and crying right from the start. I knew this was going to be long one, and I was not a bit happy. All of the sudden I felt a breeze on my bare butt. I knew the worst part of the spanking was just about to happen. Mama knew how to spank a naughty girl. She lifted that nasty old brush, and it came cracking down on my bottom. 
I let out the loudest yell you ever heard in your life. Mama said to me that if I wanted to yell then she would give me something to yell about. She whacked and yelled and whacked some more. The whole time she was lecturing about going straight to hell for lying and every other thing she could think of. By this time my bottom was hurting so badly all I could do was cry and hiccup. I didn't even realize when she stopped that rotten old spanking. I was just laying there waiting to be spanked some more. Mama helped me to my feet. She stood up and helped me pull my panties up on my very scorched bottom. I swore to her that I would never lie again. All this was said through my tears. After a while she let me go up to my room. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. Hello. My name is Amelia Angelina Rigatoni. And I am Italian. I'm very proud of that fact too. My mom and my dad are both from Sicily. I have long black hair and really dark eyes. I'm kind of on the short side. I'm waiting to develop you know where. It's so hard when you're waiting to do something. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, the reason I am telling you all this is because my mama wants me to keep a log about all the stuff I do and what happens to me when I misbehave. I think her idea is perfectly stupid, but after you get to know my mama you wouldn't argue either. Mama is as she puts it, from the old school. In case you don't understand that it means my mama spanks a lot. And I do mean a lot. My dad travels all the time so as mama says she has to be both parents. I don't have any brothers or sisters. I kind of get lonely at times, but mama and I keep each other pretty busy. I am in seventh grade. The name of the school I go to is Our Lady of the Perpetual Paddle. The sisters there are pretty nice. If you do anything bad in that place those nuns know how to make you see the light, as they say. I only just started there so I haven't seen any elite yet. Hey you don't think they mean spanking? Oh boy. I get the feeling I just might be seeing this light thing they are always talking about. Mama told me if I ever get a spanking in school I am going to get another one at home. My best friend, Anna Maria, got a spanking in school already. She didn't get it too bad, but when she got home well I don't have to tell you what happened there. In fact, she still had trouble sitting this morning in class. I know that feeling all too well. Anyway if you have the time I'll tell you what happened yesterday. I just want you to know that I am not happy about this. Mama thinks the embarrassment will make me behave better. I think I will just drop dead and die if any of my friends see this. And if there are any mamas out there don't go doing this to your kids. It is cruel and unusual punishment. Anna Maria and I met at the corner of my street. We were going to go to the mall and check out the boys. Mama thought I was going to the library. I sort of feel guilty about lying to her, but she just won't let me do the stuff I want to do. When we got to the mall we went to the food court and got a soda. She and I were checking out all the boys when out of the corner of my eye I saw my mama. I tried to get under the table or go to the bathroom, but I was busted. Mama came over to the table. She looked me right in the eye and you just would not believe what she said to me. My mama said really loud that I was going to get the spanking of my life when I got home. I just about wanted to go through the floor. All the really cool kids were looking at me. She grabbed me by the hand and sort of dragged me out of the mall. I could see all the kids laughing and saying stuff about me. All I kept thinking about was how I was going to explain this to the kids at school tomorrow. We got out to the car and Mama opened the door. She sort of pushed me into the front seat, but right before she did she smacked my but a whole lot of times. I just wanted to die right there in the parking lot. She was yelling at me and telling me how she was going to turn me over her knee. 
Of course the cutest boy in the world was getting out of his mom's car just as my mama was spanking my butt. Gosh, I figured this just can't any worse. I bet he saw the whole thing too. When we got back to our house mama made me go stand in the corner. Have you ever heard of anything that ridiculous in your life? She made me stand there for just about forever. Eventually she let me come to her. When I turned around I saw Mama had pulled a kitchen chair into the living room. I knew I was in deep trouble. She made me stand in front of her while she lectured me about the evils of lying and going to hell and all that stuff. I tried really hard not to roll my eyes at her, but I guess they have a mind of their own. All of the sudden Mama landed a great big whack on the seat of my panties. Man oh man that hurt. I said to myself that she wasn't going to make me cry this time. I was wrong. Man I was wrong. When she was done lecturing she told me to lift up my uniform. I looked at her with tears in my eyes. She told me when I act like a grown up I'll get treated like one. Gee I hope she remembers this when I'm 16. I glared at her but I stopped dead when she lifted that mean old hairbrush she just loves to spank with. I did as she asked, but I was begging and pleading the whole time. I swear that woman is deaf as can be when I'm begging not to be spanked. She made me go over her knee. Gosh I felt like such a child. I just could not believe that I was going to get spanked like a child. Mama spanked my bottom with her hand for a while. I was kicking and crying right from the start. I knew this was going to be long one, and I was not a bit happy. All of the sudden I felt a breeze on my bare butt. I knew the worst part of the spanking was just about to happen. Mama knew how to spank a naughty girl. She lifted that nasty old brush, and it came cracking down on my bottom. I let out the loudest yell you ever heard in your life. Mama said to me that if I wanted to yell then she would give me something to yell about. She whacked and yelled and whacked some more. The whole time she was lecturing about going straight to hell for lying and every other thing she could think of. By this time my bottom was hurting so badly all I could do was cry and hiccup. I didn't even realize when she stopped that rotten old spanking. I was just laying there waiting to be spanked some more. Mama helped me to my feet. She stood up and helped me pull my panties up on my very scorched bottom. I swore to her that I would never lie again. All this was said through my tears. After a while she let me go up to my room. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. When I was younger, I got caught bullying my neighbor's daughter. Unfortunately for me, the girl's mother was good friends with my mum, so after she caught me teasing her daughter, she phoned my mother straight away. My mum asked her friend to pass the phone over to me. The next thing I heard was mum telling me that as soon as she got home from work, I was going to get leathered for my misbehaviour. I had no doubt that I was in serious trouble, as mum always followed through with her threats. Sure enough, no sooner had she walked in through the door that night than she dragged me by the ear to my bedroom. Once we got to my room, mum pulled off my trousers and underpants and ordered me to lie down on the bed. She then proceeded to take the belt off the jeans she was wearing that day, then absolutely leathered my ass black and blue. The thrashing lasted at least ten minutes, and I was crying like a little boy. My sister was downstairs at the time and could clearly hear everything that was happening upstairs, she told me afterwards. Luckily she didn't tease me about it, as her own bum was certainly no stranger to a leathering from mum either. That night I couldn't sit down. I also got grounded for two weeks. But the worst part was that I had to apologize to the girl I had bullied, and my mum told the girl and her mother that I had got my bare ass tanned for my trouble. I will never forget that day. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, 
we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. The Mean Girls This story was one my mom shared with me when I was older, and it took place shortly after my parents got married and before my oldest brother was born, probably 1974 or 1975. My mom had been a teacher for a couple of years, and she taught sixth grade at all subjects, at AK, Six neighborhood school. All of the kids lived within a 15-minute drive of the school, but most were closer than that. As a small local school, there was only one class of each grade, so, barring students moving in or out, the classes were much the same from year to year. This also meant that many of the teachers knew kids from outside of their own classes. In this particular year, my mom's class had three girls, Carol, Laura, and Julie, who were just plain nasty, the stereotypical, I mean girls. My mom had seen how they acted during their two previous years, and she was not looking forward to having them in her own classroom. The girls had bad attitudes and were smug and condescending to their peers, but not really anything for which they could be formally punished. They just had nasty dispositions, their behavior in class was fine, though, and they didn't really commit any spankable offenses. Until, one day, they did. There was a girl who was new to the school that year named Lucy. All of the other kids in the class had been together for years, most of them since kindergarten, so the new girl was having trouble fitting in. To make things harder for her, Lucy was painfully shy. And to make things even harder for her, the ringleader of the mean girls, Carol, decided to have some fun at Lucy's expense. They produced a note, alleged to be from one of the cute boys in class. The note informed Lucy that he liked her and would like to go out with her, hold her hand, all of the normal sixth grade stuff. The girls told Lucy that the boy had asked them to give her the note, and they egged her on to go and talk to him. So that is what she did, unfortunately, with other kids around. Of course, the boy had no idea what Lucy was talking about, and told her so. She insisted he had sent the note. He insisted that he hadn't. She ran off, crying. After recess, word of all of this got to my mother. She investigated the story, put all the pieces together, and knew that she finally had a reason to paddle those three girls. She ordered them to the cloakroom, where corporal punishment was administered in those days, out of sight of the rest of the class, but not out of earshot. Mom picked up her paddle and excused herself to the cloakroom. The other kids in the class could barely contain their glee, they had had enough of the mean girl's shenanigans too. Once in the cloakroom, Mom dressed the girls down, telling them what she thought of their behavior and attitudes. Julie and Laura had the decency to look contrite, but Carol remained haughty and unrepentant. My mom decided to save her for last. Julie went first. Mom told her to bend over and grab her ankles. She replied, yes, ma, and did as she was told. My mom reared back and gave her a mighty wallop. Trust me, she could swing that paddle hard when she had a mind to. Julie let out a yelp but maintained her position. My mom gave her three more hard whacks. After the fourth, Julie jumped out of position, rubbing her butt. My mom ordered her back down and then gave the last whack. The girl was crying quietly and rubbing her bottom after her paddling but took her punishment the best of any of them. Laura went next. She tried the begging route, but my mom was having none of it. She also got five hard whacks, jumping out of position after each one. She was openly sobbing by the third. Then it was the turn of Carol, the ringleader. She was hysterical and completely uncooperative. She was yelling that the teacher couldn't spank her and that her mom wouldn't let it happen and generally carrying on. My mom told her that she was embarrassing herself and that she ought to take her punishment like a big girl. Even the other girls were encouraging Carol to just get it over with. 
Carol, however, still refused to assume the position. My mom eventually told her that if she wouldn't take her wax in the cloakroom, she would be sent to the principal's office. The latter had a fierce reputation as a paddler, you did not want to get spanked by him. At this threat, Carol finally relented. My mom gave her the first whack. She jumped up, rubbing her behind and dancing around. She then refused to get back in the position again. In the end, my mom had Julie and Laura hold Carol's hands in place against the wall, and she finally took all of the wax. When my mom tells this story these days, at this point she usually makes some comment about how Carol carried and was even worse than me when being spanked. I maintain that I was not nearly as bad as my mom claims. The three girls were given a discipline slip, outlining the events for their parents, with the instruction that it had to be signed and returned. Laura brought the slip back signed with nothing else said about it. Julie brought the slip back and then verbally apologized to my mom. She also gave her a written apology, which also said that she had been spanked with a belt at home by her mother. She had a similar note that she, humbly, gave to Lucy. Unfortunately for me, my mom thought this was a great idea, and in the future, I had to give a note detailing my spanking to the offended party. After this incident, Julie broke away from the other two girls and became a much more pleasant student. I'm told, although I'm too young to remember, that she babysat for us a few times while she was in high school. To the surprise of no one, Carol's mom was livid. She came to the school and pitched a fit to the principal, who was not impressed. He told her that Carol had needed a good spanking for quite some time, and that he was glad she had gotten it. Carol's behavior improved slightly for a little while, probably because she was too ashamed to bully anyone, but before long she was back to her old tricks. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. I clearly remember my first a proper a smacked bottom, which I received. Prior to this, if I had been naughty, I had received a slap on the bottom or the back of my leg. Even these minor admonishments usually made me cry loudly, as I hated being punished. On the occasion I'm describing, mum had taken me to the doctor. There were some toys for children to play with in the waiting room, and I remember sneaking a small one into my pocket. Afterwards, when we were back in the car, I took the toy out and showed it to my little sister. Mum saw us playing with it and asked what it was. I lied and told her I had found it. At that, Mum stopped the car, turned around in her seat and demanded to see the toy. She immediately informed me that she had seen it at the doctor's, and she knew I had stolen it. Mum took the toy off me and smacked the top of my leg sharply, which made me cry. She told me I was going to straight to bed when we got home, and that I was in big trouble. I rubbed my stinging leg and cried all the way home, as I hated having to go to bed early. Once we got home, mum took me by the arm and dragged me up the stairs to my bedroom. She began to give me a big telling off, and finally said, stealing and lying is very naughty, and will not be tolerated. It's time you understood what a real smacked bottom feels like. Mum led me over to the bed and bent me over her knee. She then gave me a hard smack. I remember trying to jump up and put my hand back to rub where she had smacked me, as it really stung. But she held me tight and then spanked me again, giving me about six or seven more smacks. I thought for a minute that Mum had finished, but then she said, what you did today was very serious and naughty, which is why I am punishing you, to make sure you never do this again. Mum then started to smack my bottom even harder. I screamed and wriggled around, but she held me tightly still, and slowly smacked my bare bottom another five or six times. Mum finally lifted me off her knee. She ordered me into my nightie, adding that I would go to bed until it was dinner time. 
She left and I remember clutching my bottom and rubbing it. I was sobbing, as I had never had a proper spanking like that before. I spent the rest of the afternoon lying on the bed. My backside continued to sting for the next 30 minutes or so before it wore off. However, I did learn my lesson, and I never stole anything again. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. A military childhood. I was a child born in the early 60s, my father was in the military and my mum was very much a homemaker, although she did have a part-time job at various times during my childhood. 
In our early years my upbringing was reasonably stable, with the odd move every few years, all within the UK, as my father's military career took him to different postings. With three sisters and no brothers, the rules of the house were straightforward, do as you are told, be on time, do not steal, do not backchat and our parents' decisions were final. All of this was supported by an unwritten principle that actions have consequences, this meant a range of punishments including being sent early to bed, not being allowed out, as well as physical punishment of varying severity, which changed as we got older. My sisters were always smacked by mum, this was never as formal as my own punishment and usually resulted in them paying a visit over her knee or the side of the bed and receiving a spanking with her hand. Sometimes their dresses would be lifted and on the odd occasion, their knickers would be taken down. Mum was not one for the ceremony and would punish almost immediately an offence had been committed or discovered, and my sisters knew that resisting would only make it worse. Once into their teens mum switched from her hand to the slipper, but corporal punishment for all three of my sisters became less and less frequent, they seemed to learn quicker than me, but also knew how far to push and how to shift blame. My own physical punishment was very much my father's domain, very formal and his authority was never questioned by me. I accepted that life was about learning, and sometimes I would make the wrong choices which would result in a lesson that was painful and at times humiliating. Physical punishment was always administered with the slipper or, once I was into my teens, the strap. If I was punished at school, as many children were back then, of course, I could expect similar retribution at home too. This was generally administered the evening after I had been whacked at school. This gave me 24 hours to reflect, and at times sweat, knowing what the following night was probably going to bring. As I say, my own spankings were always very different from those of my sisters. At times, they would be present when I was having my bottom smacked, but they understood that they had to sit quietly throughout, or risk being next for a sore backside. My parents divorced when I was 11 years old, and initially, I went to live with my mum, along with my sisters. This was a time when fathers got little in the way of access and as the divorce was a bitter affair, with both parents spending more time on their arguments than their children, I soon began to come off the rails at school, and as mum did not punish me, apart from the odd whack with the slipper. Between 11 and 13, I got into lots of little spats, bits of shoplifting, and general naughtiness both in and out of school. School reacted with frequent use of the slipper, the plimsoll used on most English schoolchildren, damning report cards, and notes home to my mum. Despite these punishments, I paid no real heed, continuing to play the big I am. Just before my 13th birthday, mum gave up and I found myself back living with my dad. This was a huge shock but actually, though I didn't appreciate it at the time, really what I needed. In only my first couple of weeks, I got the slipper three times from dad. I would be sent to have a bath, get changed into pyjamas, then come back downstairs. I would then be instructed to touch my toes and listen as dad gave me a short lecture on why I was in this position and what my fate would be. This was usually between four and six very solid wax, plumb in the center of my bottom. It stung, of course, but I always found myself comparing the punishment to school, and to be honest, it didn't really deter me. Don't get me wrong, I didn't enjoy it but I wanted to challenge authority and thought I could handle the consequences. Then one evening I came home from school, and my father asked me to get out the homework from the previous day that had been marked by my teacher. I lied and said it was lost, but to my horror, Dad had a letter from the school to hand and had also made a phone call himself. This was the day I got my first strapping and, believe me, it changed my attitude to corporal punishment almost instantly. I experienced pain that was nothing like the slipper and shed tears like a waterfall. At the time, Dad showed no emotion as he used the strap on me but I learned in later years that he had been genuinely upset at having to punish me like that. Life continued to be difficult for our family. Dad and I moved about a fair bit, and as I turned 15, we fell on hard times and found ourselves living in a bed and breakfast establishment, which was really more like a hostel, as the rooms were shared. I won't go into detail, but the prospect of punishment disappeared and I started to slip back into old habits at school and life in general. 
Looking back, my life was disrupted. Mum had all but turned her back on me and I probably saw disruption as a way to deal with that, without recognising where others were trying to help me. I once again became rude and at times obnoxious. However, a saviour was at hand, the landlady who would guide me through the next five years of my life. I'll tell you about her another time. Sarah and her best friend Jessie entered West High School for the first time. The two girls had grown up together and played together since they both could remember. They hung together around the gates, nervous as they awaited the bell. They looked around and saw other older students. Girls with larger chests and boys that just smiled down at them as if the girls were at a lower level. Sarah and Jessie shared similar interests, but lately Jessie seemed to think about other things. She thought about makeup and boys, rather than dolls and games. This had somewhat strained the relationship during the summer, but the girls were closer together for their first day at high school. The new students, all as nervous as each other, were assigned to different classes. Sarah was hugely disappointed that Jessie was in a different class, as they were always in the same class at their previous school. Sarah sat quietly by herself the first period and listened attentively to the teacher as the class was shown around. She was naturally shy and did not talk to anyone during the morning classes and introductions. Sarah was busting to see Jessie at morning break, just as Jessie was. Sarah waved her long brown ponytail. She noticed how Jessie, when she found her, was with another girl and two guys already. She noticed how pretty Jessie was, with blonde hair and a well-developed body. Sarah really envied her physical characteristics. Sarah this is Michael and Stephen and Rachel, Jessie said. Sarah offered a shy and nervous hi. Jessie sounded so confident. Jessie then introduced her new friends to Sarah. Um, Jess can I see you for a second, said Sarah to her friend. Excuse us, said Jessie, the others just smiled. What is it? Jessie said to Sarah. So are you going out with one of those guys? Sarah asked. Yeah, Jessie said, I think Stephen really likes me. Stephen was a cute boy in Jess's class. Sarah listened to the other four talk on and on non-stop for ten minutes, but she had had enough of the others ignoring her. She called over her friend again. Look Sarah, Jessie began, but Sarah interrupted her. Why do you ignore me like this? Sarah said. Look. Sarah was furious. She went to touch Jessie but she hit her very hard, and her friend went tumbling to the ground. What was that for? Jessie screamed and shoved her back. Within twenty seconds the pair were rumbling on the ground and clawing at each other. A teacher broke them up as a crowd gathered round. They were sent to the principal's office. Mr. Jackson, the principal, how could this happen to two good friends on your first day here, he asked rhetorically. He called both of their parents and explained the situation. Both girls dreaded going home. They spent the rest of the day scared of what might happen at home and were not interested in their school day. When Sarah got home, she quietly slipped up to her room to begin her homework, hoping her mother would not see her. But she had noticed. Being a single parent, she was responsible for all the discipline in the household, for Sarah and her sister Bonnie. The discipline usually meant a spanking. Sarah's mother knocked on her door. Sarah, I think we have something to discuss. Mrs. Timms entered the room and sat on Sarah's bed and explained why she was stupid and virtually said what the principal had said earlier in the day. For this, love, you will receive a firm spanking over my knee, but first I have an extra treat in store. Mrs. Timms went across the hallway into the bathroom, where she retrieved a cake of soap. She pinched Sarah's freckly nose and her mouth popped open. At this point, Sarah's mother placed the cake into her mouth. She waited for ten minutes while her daughter gargled and choked. She was thoroughly in tears afterwards. Sarah's mother wasted no time, and she was stretched over Mrs. Tim's well-accustomed knee. Mrs. Tim's picked up Sarah's large, thick and flat-backed hairbrush from on top of her desk. She began the spanking. Crack the went the brush. 
Sarah instantly yelped in pain, and she burst into tears again. Crack the crack the crack the Sarah screamed out in pain, but Mrs. Timms had not nearly finished. Her whole bottom was now stinging with pain as the brush whacked down on the defenseless crying teenager's wounded backside. Crack the another yell, and a flurry of tears. Sarah could not concentrate on anything, the pain was so immense. Crack the 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 hairbrush whacked Sarah's bottom for the last time that day. The brush was put down. Sarah's mother then gave her 15 or 20 hard hand slaps to finish the job. Now make up with Jessie, said Mrs. Timms. Yes mommy, said Sarah, blubbering like a. Sarah rang her best friend and apologized and told her side of the story, as did Jessie. They both now talked to Jess's new friends at school, and Sarah was really fitting in. She was happy. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors, and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. A stroke of respectability. One aspect of parental discipline which is not often talked about is how some mothers and fathers deliberately tried to emulate at home the sort of punishments their offspring could expect, at least back in the day, during school hours. This is perhaps particularly true in the UK, where a surprising number of middle-class parents would keep a cane to discipline their offspring. I have given a great deal of thought to the impulses behind such practices. Obviously, one factor is a desire to be firm, even strict, with your offspring as they learn and grow, and certainly, it was definitely felt amongst us youngsters that the parents of those who kept a cane for their bottoms were up there as the strictest, it was almost a badge of honor. But among parents themselves, I would say that an even greater impulse was the somewhat desperate urge to seek respectability above all things. This was at a time when the class system in Britain was very much a tangible thing, and it was perhaps felt that this respectability would cause them to be more widely accepted in the upper echelons of society. Reputation was a precious commodity. Indeed, speaking from just my own experience, I lost count of the number of times I heard the phrase, what will the neighbours think? So, I think part of the search for this elusive badge of respectability was for our parents to emulate what they thought happened to the naughty offspring of the upper classes, given that their parents paid large sums of money from them to go to strict, private schools where the cane was freely in use. It was no doubt this factor that led to my own mother purchasing a proper rattan punishment cane for me and, believe me, it was put to very regular use across my bottom during my formative years. Of course, I had been given ordinary, smacked bottoms over her knee when I was a younger child, but being told to lower bend over for the cane was on a whole different level as a punishment. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors, and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, None of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. The Honey Strapping I was brought up in tropical Queensland, Australia, far removed from most of the trappings of civilization. As we lived on outback cattle stations, the five kids were educated by a mix of the local Aborigines and mum, doing the best she could with the assistance of lessons broadcast on School of the Air. She also did an enormous job in helping the local Aborigines and managing the property, so she didn't have a real lot of time to study the latest child-raising and educational theories. She always reckoned that lots of hard work, unconditional love, and a few good licks with the strap now and then were the recipe for keeping us on the straight and narrow. Dad was out and about the property most of the time. We sometimes went with him, but he seemed to consider that discipline was mum's job. Our Aboriginal kids had never seen much of town life, and in the hot tropical climate. 
every day, some of us would be smacked on the bare legs or rump for some naughtiness. No big deal, but it made a great slapping sound and left clear hand marks for viewing. Mum kept her whippy little strap hanging up in the kitchen, and used it vigorously when she was frazzled with her work and tormented by naughty offspring. The discipline was mostly immediate and spontaneous, a few whacks rather than a whipping. However, the first exception to this was quite memorable for myself and my twin brother Andrew. Our eldest sister had brought into the kitchen a huge pot of honey extracted from the beehives. I was chasing a Drew through the house when he collided with the honey and sent it flying onto the kitchen floor. We were like a couple of sleek and slippery brown eels as we slithered around in it, unable to get up. Our entire year's supply of honey, you can imagine the sticky mess. I have never seen mum so angry. She sent Andrew and I out to the back veranda shower, with instructions to get back in here when you're clean, as she organised the other three to clean up the disaster. She told us to sit on the rumpus room table. Andrew gave a little laugh at the kids struggling in the kitchen, and mum whacked him on the front of his thigh. It was clearly the wrong time for humour. She told us both to put hands on the head as we sat there and slapped poor Drew again and again on his fully exposed bare brown legs. He yelped and squirmed, to no avail. Then it was my turn. I had often been slapped before, but this was different, God, how she stung me. Her hand on my wet flesh made an enormous smacking sound and the kitchen cleaning team was spellbound. I reached down to rub my legs but that only attracted another barrage. The fronts of our thighs were covered with red hand marks, but, alas, there was more coming. Stand up and face the wall, hands still on the head, she commanded. Again she started on Andrew, smacking the back of his legs, then his buttocks. I dared not look, but I could tell the difference as leg smacks give a sharper sound, a smack on the bum sounds richer and deeper. My own thighs were on fire but I knew better than to touch them. I sort of jiggled around to ease the sting, bringing some giggles from the audience. Now for you, young lady. A great slap to the back of my left leg, and another, and another. I could feel where mum's palm landed in the middle of my thigh, and the fingers curling around the side. Then the other leg, and eventually moved up to the rump. She cupped my two lower cheeks in her hands, pressing up behind me and almost whispering that I would remember to be careful in the future, wouldn't I? Then the spanking, alternately on both sides, oh, what intensity! What exquisite placement she had, no two slaps quite the same. I gasped and yelped and hopped around, what a spectacle! Then we heard it, the strap coming off its wall hook. The whipping was delivered very slowly. First a statement about our sins, then the sound of the impact and its dreadful sting on one side of the rump, then the other, then licking around the legs. Then the same for Andrew. Then another little lecture and more strapping. Again and again and again, I don't know how she had such skill but she placed those stinging stripes wrapped around the curves of our legs and hips without ever causing damage that would last more than a day. Our brothers and sister viewed it all from behind but I was past caring. Stay there, said mum, while we finish in the kitchen. As she turned away, I involuntarily put a hand to my bum. She saw it, and, without a word, turned again and slapped me on the back of the legs. I squealed and squirmed, she slapped and slapped, but kept my hands on my head. This intense experience was never quite repeated but it added that little edge of dreadful anticipation to the frequent occasions when the strap was used on the five of us, particularly in the company of our friends. There is just nothing the same as the sound of that strap and its savage sting. Being on display and sporting the stripes just completes the picture. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. One of my granny's neighbours, the Innes family, was widely rumoured to be frequent smackers. 
On our regular visits up north, my cousins and their friends would gleefully share with us stories of being at the Innes house or in the local shops, even in the church, and hearing Mr. or Mrs. Innes threatening to their offspring hard in front of everyone. This particularly amused my cousin Jamie a one year my senior, and his friends, as Roddy Innes was their classmate and friend, very popular, athletic, and just a little bit cocky. The boys were thrilled by the idea of their confident friend being knocked down a peg or two by his mum or dad, and if they ever felt Roddy's ego was getting too inflated, his friends would mockingly threaten to smack his bottom, dissolving into fits of laughter, as poor Roddy's face flushed with embarrassment. He would always vehemently deny the smackings actually took place, insisting that the threat was just an expression used by his parents to scare him and his little sister Heather into behaving themselves. While I knew for a fact that Uncle Alistair and Auntie Janet smacked my cousins Jamie and Catriona at least once a month, I also knew that this was only ever four or five very hard hand smacks, delivered over the clothing. Although nowhere near as taboo as it is now, by the mid-90s smacking was definitely on its way out of fashion, and I didn't know of anyone other than myself and Charlotte who got smacked using an implement. So I would listen intently to these discussions between Jamie, Roddy, and their friends, watching Roddy closely for any signs that there might be some truth to the rumours, a clue that to smack you hard was anything more than an empty threat. I had never even seen a smacked before, and I used to pray that the rumours were indeed true, and that one day I would witness Roddy Innes being disciplined. I imagined various scenarios over and over in my head, alternating between his mum and his dad being the smacker. Although only young at the time, I had realised a few years previously that I had in fact always enjoyed all facets of smacking. Although mum and to a far lesser extent dad and Claire had given me plenty of memories to look back on, I desperately craved being involved in a smacking that wasn't just myself or Charlotte in the firing line. I mentally embellished every swat I had ever seen others receive over the years, with my mind fantasizing that the solitary slap I had witnessed was just a precursor to a far more serious smacking the child would be receiving once home. I kept a detailed mental log of every single smack I had ever witnessed. The little girl in the dentist waiting room whose constant whining earned her a smack on the leg, the little boy who had got three sharp slaps for running away from his mum, my uncle pulling over at the side of the road and giving Jamie and Catriona's bums five very hard slaps each for continually arguing in the car, the little boy on the train, arm grabbed and bum scalped for not staying in his seat. Every detail of these encounters, and countless others, had been repeatedly revisited, my brain trying to mentally recreate the sounds and sights of what I had witnessed, and how excited it had made me feel. But still, like an addict, I craved fresh material. In public, I was often accused of daydreaming, when in reality I would be meticulously studying adult and child encounters for any hint of an impending smack, or rushing towards the sound of crying, on the off chance that a smacking was taking place nearby. Shameful though it was, and is, I was utterly obsessed. I was never brave enough to outright ask my own friends about their parental punishments, but I would watch and listen intently if they ever spoke of being in any kind of trouble at home, obsessively looking for any indication that they had been, or soon would be, smacked. Sometimes if one of them got sent home from school with a bad report card or a punishment exercise, I would desperately try to keep my face and voice neutral, and casually ask something like, what will your mum and dad say, watching closely for clues that their bottoms would soon be sore. Unfortunately for me, however, most of my friends had very liberal, modern appearance, and there was never any indication that my friends received punishments more severe than the naughty step, or maybe a couple of pats on the clothed bum in the most extreme of circumstances. I quickly decided that the more traditionally minded parents of my dad's rural home village were a better bet than the lax Edinburgh child-rearing crowd, and so my visits up north to stay with Granny or dad's brother Alistair, and his family became even more exciting for me. Of course, I would be thrilled for scintillating details of any smacked bottoms, but my absolute ultimate goal was to be told about, here or, best yet, actually see Roddy Innes being punished. I must admit that I, like most girls he knew, was quite smitten with Roddy, 
who was kind and funny and had inherited his dad's mischievous sparkly blue eyes. And so I became utterly obsessed, a girl on a mission. I used to hang about Granny's garden, pretending to play, whilst keenly keeping watch, trying to see or hear any signs of children getting into trouble in the Innes house next door. I closely watched Roddy and Heather in church, looking to see if they were fidgeting excessively on the hard wooden pews, and if they were, I would spend the rest of the day wondering if their restlessness was caused by a sore bottom. Rather than going to theirs, I would ask for my cousins Jamie and Capriona to visit us at Granny's house, on the off chance that they would bring me with them to visit their friends next door. I strongly encouraged a friendship between Charlotte and Roddy's sister Heather, hoping to grill the little girl for details about her and her big brother's punishments, although unfortunately she too was very coy about the subject, obviously having been well warned by Roddy to keep quiet about it. I often tried to casually work the Innes family into conversation with my granny or my aunt and uncle, desperately hoping any details, even minor ones, would be revealed about their household discipline. My obsessive efforts were met with very little reward, and I would inevitably head back to Edinburgh thoroughly disappointed that I had nothing new to keep my fantasies alive until my next visit. I had all but given up, thinking that maybe the rumours were in fact baseless, as Roddy so strongly insisted, when I had a thrilling encounter in the local co-op store. For some reason, it was just me and Uncle Alistair in the shop, and I remember languidly pushing the trolley by his side, quite bored without my sister or cousins there. Then I heard it. A little girl crying, a woman crossly saying, No, Heather. You've been told. I immediately whipped my head up, and to my delight, I saw Heather Innes being firmly led out the store by her mum. I looked around the store for Roddy, but instead was met by the sight of his dad, walking towards us, his basket of shopping hooked over his large forearm. He was warmly smiling at me and Alistair, his friend since childhood. Trouble, asked my uncle, nodding his head in the direction of the door Heather, and her mum had just exited through. Ewan Innes rolled his eyes and said in his broad local accent, oh, she'll soon ken war her legs him. Laughing, he and Alistair said their goodbyes and parted ways, resuming their shopping. I was confused. Achingly curious. I had to know. Was Heather's little bum about to be scalped by her mum? I managed to contain myself until we were back in the car, where I felt my uncle was more likely to go into detail. Trying my best to sound nonchalant, I asked him what Mr. Innes had meant. It means she'll soon know where her legs hang from, as all her attention will soon be focused on her bottom. My heart stopped. Oh, like a smack. I slowly replied, keeping my head turned towards the side window so that he wouldn't see the excited expression on my face. My uncle confirmed that this was indeed the case. Keen to keep our conversation on this topic for as long as possible, I commented that I hoped Myrie Innes wouldn't be borrowing Granny's wooden spoon. Uncle Alistair laughed at this, as Granny's wooden spoon was something of a legend amongst my dad and his siblings, having played such a big role in their childhoods. Oh, don't worry, I'm fairly sure Ewan and Myrie have one or two wooden spoons and some slippers of their own by now. I couldn't believe my ears. After all my desperate efforts to obtain even meagre scraps of information about discipline in the Innes house, here was my uncle, just casually offering up all this salacious information on a plate. Wooden spoons. Slippers. I could scarcely believe my luck at having been in the right place at the right time. Despite being something that I would normally listen to intently, I was barely paying attention as Uncle Alistair recounted a tale of Granny having made good use of her trusty smacking spoon on his young self and Ewan Innes for some childhood prank gone awry. I was too preoccupied by thoughts of Ewan's own son and daughter, and what his wife might be doing to little Heather's backside at that very moment. I had a sleepover with Capriona that night, and so couldn't even have any private time in bed to mull over this exciting new information. As much as I enjoyed my cousin's company, I was desperate to get back to Granny's house and see her neighbours. My wish was granted when I returned the next afternoon and saw Heather Innes out playing in her back garden. 
She was gracelessly wobbling around the paving stones on a pair of yellow and blue Fisher-Price roller skates and didn't quite look her usual smiley self. Seizing on this, I asked her if she was okay, adding that her dad had mentioned she would be going over her mom's knee for a smacked bum the previous night. I don't know what possessed me, I was never normally so direct, but I think I was delirious with the previous day's revelation. Heather's face turned scarlet when I mentioned her smacked bottom, her embarrassed response instantly confirming that it had indeed occurred. My mum sometimes smacks me and Charlotte, I added, in an effort to make her open up. I was a different person, suddenly shameless and direct, in complete contrast with my usual slow and surreptitious information gathering. Little Heather muttered something, looking down shyly at her roller skates. I hate getting smacked, she repeated, slightly louder the second time. I was about to start grilling her for all the details, what was used on her bottom, how many smacks, mum or dad, corner time afterwards, was her bottom still sore etc., but before I could begin my detailed interrogation, we were interrupted by the back door of their house bursting open. Heather Innes, said Myrie, her strict tone music to my ears, I obviously didn't scalp you hard enough last night. The little girl's face blanched as her mum marched out of the house towards her. No, mummy, you did, you did, her daughter desperately insisted, tears welling up in her large blue eyes. Her mother replied, no, the little girl with a properly smacked bum wouldn't dare leave the mess that you did in that kitchen. She emphasised the word dare with a hard smack across the seat of Heather's jeans. Tears now spilled down the little girl's face and she continually sniffled as her mum listed a litany of offences, crumbs on the countertop, bread not put away, plate not in the dishwasher, sticky little handprints on the fridge door, the list went on and on. So does that, Myrie asked, with another hard smack on her daughter's bottom sound like the actions of a girl whose bottom was thoroughly scalped the night before. No, mummy, came Heather's response, as much a plea for clemency as it was an answer to her mum's question. No, repeated Myrie, pursing her lips in displeasure. So let's remedy that, shall we? She placed a hand firmly on her daughter's shoulder and started wheeling her little girl's roller skate-clad feet towards the house. Heather's crying and sniffling turned to sob as her mum uttered the words I was longing to hear, I'm going to pull down your pants and smack you hard. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. I was brought up in what was then West Germany during the 1970s. Both myself and my older sister were regularly spanked when we misbehaved. However, perhaps because of having children of different sexes, my mother always made sure that spankings were given in private, so I never actually watched Christina, who is five years my senior, getting spanked at home. However, during one summer we went to visit my mother's sister in her house in the countryside. Aunt Anna had no children of her own but certainly knew how to administer a spanking, as we were to find out during our visit. Aunt Anna certainly did not care much for privacy like my mother did. So it came about that after I acted up at the breakfast table one morning, my aunt pulled me close and smacked my bottom sharply several times as I stood there. I did cry a little bit but it wasn't as bad as what I usually got from our mother. One afternoon towards the end of our stay, Christina went out to spend some time with some other girls in the village whose acquaintance she had made during the visit. Unfortunately for her, she lost track of time and was late home. Aunt Anna had ordered Christina to be home for dinner at six o'clock, and when she hadn't returned by half past, my aunt began to worry that something might have happened to her. She eventually decided to go looking for Christina herself, leaving me in the house by myself. It wasn't very long before my aunt returned with my sister more or less in tow. We were ordered to sit down at the dinner table and the meal was eaten pretty much in awkward silence. 
As the meal came to an end, we were about to jump up from our seats and help with the washing up, but Aunt Anna had other ideas. Christina, come here to me. My aunt pulled her chair out from the table and turned it around to sit facing outwards. As my sister approached, Aunt Anna placed her in the customary spanking position over her knee. My aunt began smacking my sister's bottom. She certainly knew how to spank, and it wasn't long before Christina began to cry hard. I tried to engage Christina in a whispered conversation about how much it had hurt, but she was in no mood uh, and probably too embarrassed to confide in her little brother. This was the only time I saw my older sister spanked.
Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. I read recently that someone doubted the truth of stories of corporal punishment experienced by girls at school beyond primary school, suggesting that these were actually the fertile imagination of guys. To be fair, it is a fact that a significant proportion of anecdotes involving spanking are written by men who probably get a kick out of it, sometimes even pretending to be girls themselves. In my humble experience, I tend to find that one giveaway is that guys tend to concentrate on the intimate aspects of these stories, whilst girls often tend to skate over such matters. However, that doesn't mean to say that all stories about girls receiving corporal punishment in secondary schools, even in mixed company, are fictitious. If you surf the internet as much as I do, you'll encounter a number of experiences that actually sound quite authentic. One girl cheerfully admitted that she used to deliberately forget her games kit, knowing that it would mean three whacks over her knickers with a gym shoe known in British schools as the slipper, which she found preferable to doing games in freezing or wet weather. I think it was the same school which offered the pupils, both boys and girls, a choice between detention and a three-stroke slippering in front of the class for forgetting their homework. Many pupils of both sexes chose the slipper, it appears that there was little embarrassment attached to the punishments, as they occurred so frequently. In single-sex schools in this era in 1950s to 1970s, the spanking and caning of girls was more widespread, especially in private, independent schools. Back in the 90s, I corresponded with a South African nurse who had a keen interest in spanking. You're probably aware that CP in South Africa has always been quite common, and may well still take place, for all I know. My correspondent had attended a boarding school where the strap on the seat, rather than the hands, was quite common. She was strapped by her housemistress on a number of occasions. This lady's most memorable punishment came from the headmistress after she'd been caught out of bounds with a young man by a duty mistress. Although I attended five different schools in my childhood, both state and independent, and witnessed spankings on a number of occasions, I was only once present when a girl in school uniform was punished. This was my sister, at home. I should say that our parents rarely spanked. It was a short, sharp shock and over in seconds, and I gather it was something her own mother had used as discipline. On this occasion, I don't recall what my sister had done wrong. Maybe she'd answered back, something which definitely wasn't tolerated, or possibly she hadn't changed out of her school uniform. But I do recall her being spanked with a plastic spatula in a standing position with her navy blue knickers down, and her school skirt held up out of the way.
Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on mine. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. Paddle Spanking by the Lake I am now 50 years old, but I can still remember the spankings I received when I was younger. I grew up in a household of four girls, and neither mother nor father had any qualms about giving our backsides a good spanking if we stepped out of line. My parents kept a duck egg blue wooden paddle in the hallway just for such occasions. If we were disobedient or naughty, we would be spanked on the spot. Mother would grab the paddle and spank us, usually in a standing position. She would hold our hands out of the way while administering a very sound smacking. I can recall one memorable event when we went on a family holiday in 1977. It was a hot summer's day and we were driving around the shores of a popular lake. Father was driving and mother was in the passenger seat, with four fractious youngsters behind them on the bench seat. My sisters and I were all acting up and eventually, mother yelled, stop it right now, or I will make your father pull this car over and I will give each of you a good spanking. We quietened down for a few minutes at the threat of a sore bottom, but after a few minutes, we were back at it again. Mum turned to my dad and said, Right, Gavin, I've had enough. Pull this car over. As dad found somewhere convenient to pull over, mum removed the blue wooden paddle from the glove box, it went with us on all long road trips for just such occasions as this. Father did as he was told. He pulled over on the verge of the road next to the lake, then mother pulled each of us in turn from the back of the car. One by one, mother put us over one knee, then gave each of our bottoms one very embarrassing and public spanking with the paddle. A number of cars drove past as we were chastised, witnessing the event. One even honked its horn, by way of parental support. I can still recall my intense embarrassment to this day, and for days afterward, on the trip, I was worried that fellow tourists might recognize me as one of the four little girls having their bottoms smacked by their mother at the side of the lake.
Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. Catholic Household I was the youngest of five children who grew up in a loving but strict Catholic household in Ireland. Like most Catholics, my parents were firm believers in the value of corporal punishment. My mother was usually responsible for our discipline, which usually meant a well-smacked bottom from the maternal hand. Sometimes an old leather slipper was also used, which our mother told us had often been applied to her own bottom. For serious misdemeanors, our father took us into our parents' bedroom, where a leather belt was kept in the top drawer. Getting the belt was a painful experience, although thankfully rare. However, my three sisters, one brother, and I were high-spirited children and it was seldom that a week went by without one of us being smacked hard. Spankings were always administered in private unless two or more of us were being punished for the same crime. In that case, we stood facing the wall while the others were put through their paces. If we just getting a hand spanking, my mother would say, come here and get yourself ready. It was unwise to argue, as it would only earn an even sorer bottom. I well remember the feeling of settling myself over my mother's lap. If you were going to get the slipper, you would be sent to fetch it yourself. My mother had had plenty of experience of smacking bottoms and she wasted no time in her deliverance. The first smack would always make me try and cover my bottom with my hands. However, she knew to expect this and was ready to grab both wrists in one hand while smacking with the other. During a spanking, the smacks and cries would be audible throughout the whole house and you could even tell whether it was a hand, slipper, or leather belt that was being applied from the different noises they made. I remember in particular the time when myself and my brother were caught stealing from a local newsagent. My father was away at the time, but my mother was equal to the task. After an hour's wait in our bedroom, my mother called for my brother. I heard the door to my parents' bedroom open and close, the top drawer open and close, then a short silence before the crack of leather on bare buttocks echoed through the house. A few more followed before my brother started pleading for my mother to stop, but they went on for some time before they finally stopped. By this time I was sick with fear but when my name was called, I obediently went to the door, passing my sobbing brother on the way. Closing the door behind me, I lay down across my mother's lap and waited for the first smack. The whipping which followed was the hardest I ever got. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. Systematic Paddle Spanking when I was growing up in the late 70s and early 80s, spanking had somewhat gone out of vogue. Many parents, including mine, believed that more permissive methods were the answer to general misbehavior. My own parents always allowed me a large amount, too large in reflection, of freedom. However, when I was six, my father passed away, leaving my mom a single parent with a very young child on her hands. Admittedly, she did the best that she could but as I grew older, I began to get out of hand. I will add, that my own misbehaviour was certainly nothing illegal, like you may hear about from today's younger generations, however, it certainly took a downward spiral. At first, my mother dismissed it as early signs of standard adolescent rebellion and really thought nothing of it. She had a very demanding job that didn't allow her a lot of free time, so when I misbehaved, I'd be grounded or lectured and that was that. What was worse was that the only thing consistent about her discipline methods was her inconsistency. When I was grounded or put on restriction, I'd simply get out of it by nagging her, or just ignore it. 
And so as this continued, my grades dropped and my attitude got worse and worse. Then, when I was about 13, we moved. My mother had been offered a new job that allowed more money and better hours, whereas had we stayed put, she would have been stuck in a job she didn't like making a fraction of what she was worth. Anyway, with that move, things began to change. For one thing, since she was home by five or so every day, she got to see a lot more of me, and thus she saw more and more of my behaviour. I had got so used to the freedom, and her permissive discipline, that I was getting more out of hand than before, and she noticed it. At first, it was just little things, but as time progressed, during the first few months following our move, she began to realise that maybe grounding and a good talking to wasn't helping. So finally, she decided to try something different. One day, I don't remember the exact circumstances, we had an argument. I was clearly in the wrong, but being a 13-year-old boy, and with a tradition in the house of lax punishment, I just pressed on arguing. Finally, my mouth got ahead of me and I really shot off. I don't remember exactly what I said but it was venal and very petty. My mother was infuriated, she sent me to my room and told me to wait for her. I thought I was just going to get another lecture, so I stomped off to my room. When she finally came up, she did lecture me. However, this time she did it holding a brand new paddle. She had had a friend make it in his woodshop, it was stained red and was about a foot and half long, six inches wide, about three quarters of an inch thick, with three holes right down the centre. On the handle was the words, Mom's Helper. I was transfixed and for once, my mom's lecture actually made an impact. She told me she was fed up with my behaviour, that for a long time I had been getting worse and worse and she had done everything she knew how to. So from now on, it was going to be different, and if I wasn't going to respond to anything else, maybe it was time to get my attention a different way. There was to be no more grounding, and the only time she'd waste her breath to lecture would be at times like these. She added that she was sorry it had come to this, but if she couldn't reason with me to behave, she could show me the consequences in a way that I'd remember. She then told me to stand up and turn around. By this time, it was all starting to sink in and I was realising that for once, I was really in trouble and that there was no way to get out of it. I was told, quite firmly to bend over my bed while she continued to lecture. When she had finished, she asked me if I understood and when I said, yes, she gave me a light little tap with the paddle to warn me it was about to start. Then I heard her raise the paddle and the first smack hit home. It was a whole new experience for me. It wasn't agonising, at least at first, but it left a good sting. The paddle was heavy so the impact was big enough but thin enough to sting with the aid of the holes. She really laid it on, probably twenty smacks. For a woman who had never spanked her offspring before, she really knew what she was doing. Suddenly she stopped, and I thought she was finished. But mom just asked me if it was sinking in, and when I nodded, she replied, good, and added that she was really going to make sure it did. So again, I heard her draw back the paddle and I felt the impact, this time much harder. She was determined that it would be a spanking to remember. By the end of it, I was crying and promising to be good. But most of all, I realised how long I'd really had it coming and that from now on, things were going to be a lot different. And they certainly were. Later that evening, when I'd finally settled down a little and was feeling very contrite, we had a discussion over dinner and mom explained to me her new system of rules. First, grounding and restriction were cut out of the plan entirely, and from that point on, all misbehaviour earned a spanking. There were two types of misbehaviour, major and minor. Major misbehaviour would be things like sneaking out, open defiance or disobedience, discipline problems at school also counted. Minor things would be almost everything else, mostly things that by themselves would not be important, but because they occurred so much, they were a problem. For major infractions I would get a spanking, that's all there was to it, but minor things got treated a little differently. From then on, she was to keep a small notepad with her at all times and when I misbehaved, I would get written up. I wouldn't be told that things were being written down so I just had to be as good as I could. 
At the end of the week, she'd review the list and for each thing on it. Well, the week went by much as usual. I was careful to be polite and respectful, but then again, old habits are hard to break. So I managed not to get spanked during the week and by the end, I thought that Saturday was going to be a breeze. I was in for a surprise. Saturday went by okay, my mom was perfectly amiable, we went shopping for some school clothes because August was drawing to an end and school was going to start in a few weeks. But when we got home on Saturday night, my mom reminded me that we had a matter to settle and asked me to go up to my room while she started dinner. So up I went, wondering how my night was going to turn out. She came up after about 30 minutes, with the mom's helper, in one hand and a little notebook in the other. So much for being well behaved, it turned out that I had been written up 12 times, including 3 times for backtalk and 4 times over chores. In the first week, I had managed to earn 60 spanks. Also, that meant I would get half that night and half the next morning. Accepting my fate, I turned around to bend over the bed. Once I was bent over the bed, she began the paddling in doses, reading out each infraction and following it with a dose of five hard spanks. I started crying after the first ten and by the end, I was kicking and squirming, knowing I was getting my just deserts. After the thirtieth spank, she let me cry for a while but then she sat down and gave me a hug, then let me get redressed so we could eat. After dinner, I had to help with the dishes and then go straight to bed. Mom said we'd be going to the later service at church, so we could take care of my remaining discipline, but that I still needed to get to bed. So I brushed my teeth, got into my pyjamas, set my alarm for seven and got into bed. Needless to say, I slept on my stomach that night. The next morning, when I woke up, I was a lot less sore. When I got downstairs, my mom was already up and she said we'd deal with my punishment after breakfast. So when we were through, we went into the living room, and she told me to go over the arm of the couch. The couch was more comfortable but it was also taller, which would give her a better shot and so I got 30 more, in bursts of 5, and by the end, I was even sorrier and vowing to clean up my act. All in all, from my mom's perspective the results were very satisfactory, although I was distracted from the sermon by my paddled posterior. From then on, I knew that my mom meant business. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. Spanked at Disneyland. It was on a trip to France with my mother. One of the things we were due to do on the trip was spending a whole day at Disneyland Paris. I was very excited about this, as I think most people of my age, at the time, would be. The first few days of our trip went well but the night before our day at Disneyland, I was so overexcited that mom had to threaten me with a spanking if I didn't settle down and go to bed. I obeyed, and my bottom escaped a spanking for now. Unfortunately, by morning I was back to being hyper. However, mom was in a good mood and displayed a lot of patience with me. She packed our backpack with extra clothes and other things we needed, then we went to find the bus which would take us to the resort. I was told to hold mom's hand all the time since Paris was a big city and I could easily get lost on the way to the bus. At one point, I failed to stop for the red light on a crossing. Fortunately, mom managed to grab me by the hand and pulled me back. She told me off for being careless about traffic and gave me a hard smack on the seat of my pants, it hurt a lot, but not enough to make me cry. The smack made me settle down and we got on the bus. Upon arrival at Disneyland, the bus driver told my mom the bus would return at 5 to pick us, day visitors, back up. Once again, mom warned me to stay close so I did not get lost. We had not been at the resort long, however, before I became hyper again. I did stay with mom as directed but was continually wanting to try this, then that, and I kept dragging her around. Finally, mom had had enough. 
She found a bench and mom placed me in time out there while she lectured me about my behavior and scolded me for my impatience. Having calmed me down yet again, she took out a map and had me point out where I wanted to go first. I think it was the Dumbo Carousel, and it was great fun. At noon, just before lunch, we watched the big parade with all the Disney characters, it was amazing. After that, we ate some lunch and while mom took a little break I was allowed to play at the nearby playground. While I was playing there, some of the Disney characters walked past. I wandered off to meet and hug them. So it was that when mom went to retrieve me from the playground, I was nowhere to be seen. Mom was extremely worried, as you might imagine. She contacted park staff and they put a missing child call out over their walkie-talkie. Just at that moment, and to her immense relief, mom spotted me, I was with Cinderella. Mom ran over to me, hugged me, but then started to scold me too. After informing security that I had been found, she took me to the restroom, but not to use it for toilet purposes. Once inside the restroom, mom bent me over one of her legs and spanked me hard with her hand on the seat of my pants. I got about ten smacks, and this time I did cry. I cried even harder when mom told me I would also be getting a good smacked bottom at bedtime. I was on my best behavior for the rest of the day, hoping against hope that mom wouldn't smack my bottom again. However, after dinner, she told me it was bedtime and once I was in my pajamas, mom came into my room holding the hairbrush she reserved for my chastisement. Mom told me how scared and worried she had been when she lost me, then with a loving but stern look in her eyes, she told me to bend over her knee. I didn't really have much choice about such things at that age. I lay over her knee obediently and mom gave me ten smacks each with her hairbrush. After I had had a little cry, mom made me decent again and put me into bed. She kissed me on the forehead, told me that she loved me and said I was forgiven. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. The bond of a double spanking. My parents always spanked me soundly whenever they felt it was necessary. I can't remember what age I got my first, but it was well before I started school. Mom would generally spank me hard with her hand. However, sometimes she would take off her slipper and give it to me with that, and sometimes I got her hairbrush. My spankings were always a private affair, with the exception of one occasion. We often met with a friend of my mother's, who also had a daughter. Alice was the same age as me but in every other way my opposite. Even as a child, Alice was always precise, perfect, tidy, obedient and polite. In my mom's eyes, she was the perfect daughter. I just couldn't stand her, in fact, I hated her. Alice didn't do anything against me, but I couldn't stand the constant comparisons my mother made between her and me. The unbearable thing was that despite the fact that I hated her, since my mother was very close to her mother, we happened to hang out very often. Another thing I despised about Alice was that, despite being the same age, she looked older than me. I definitely looked younger than my age while Alice looked appreciably older. She was taller than me, and at this age I was jealous. One Sunday afternoon, like many others, we were in the park. While the mothers were chatting and having coffee, we were playing ball with other kids, in spite of the prohibition signs in every corner, the threats of the caretaker, and above all the recommendations of our mothers, who had expressly forbidden us to play with the ball. At one point, the ball rolled out of the park fence and landed on the street. Alice rushed into the road to get it, forgetting to look for cars. The first car suddenly braked so as not to run over my companion. However, the car behind rear-ended the first, and the same thing happened with the following vehicle. In an instant, all the other kids had gone, and it was just the two of us, with the ball in our hands, surrounded by angry drivers. Pretty soon the police arrived and handed us back to our mothers. 
As dinner had been planned for that evening at our house, and our mothers decided it wasn't fair to scrap it on account of our misbehavior. So as soon as we got into Alice's mother's car, we were told that once we got home we would receive the most memorable spanking of our young lives. This caused new tears in us. All the way, we listened to lectures from our mothers, coupled with the promises of sore backsides to come. It was the first time I was going to be spanked in front of someone who wasn't a member of the family, and it was even more irksome that it was to be right in front of that little girl I hated. The prospect of seeing Alice spanked, however, was very interesting. I knew that her mother spanked her because our mothers often talked about corporal punishment. Truth be told, it was usually my mother who talked about my punishments because Alice rarely did anything bad. As soon as we got home, our mothers sat on two chairs in the kitchen and called us. Adrienne. Alice. The tone of their voices made it clear they were not expecting any reply except complete obedience. Sobbing and trembling, Alice and I went to be punished. My eyes were full of tears and I dared not look towards the other girl, who I could hear sobbing not far from me. I hadn't reckoned that mom would spank me in front of Alice and her mom. At home, I was always been spanked, but never in front of anyone. My mom spanked with her right hand, while Alice's was left-handed, so she was lying over her mother's lap the opposite way to mine. With the chairs lined up, we could look at each other if we lifted our heads off the floor. Without further lecturing, the spanking began. That time we were really spanked at LOT. We were both screaming loudly. My resolve to take my swats in silence lasted only very briefly, and Alice also quickly succumbed to screams and tears. We weren't very different in taking our spanks after all, just as our mothers didn't seem very different in spanking us. After a while, Alice's mom stopped and asked my mother for a wooden spoon, because her hand ached. My mom made me get up for a moment and handed her friend the spoon, while Alice, between sobs, begged her to stop. Perhaps to equalize things, my mother took off a slipper and made me return to her lap. Then our spankings both restarted, markedly more painful than before. After this second round of swats, which seemed like an eternity to me, our moms both stopped at the same time. As soon as we had calmed down, they made us get up and we were each put in a corner of the kitchen while the mothers cooked. When dinner was ready, we were at last allowed to leave our corners. Then they made us sit at the table to have dinner. They also had the kindness to put a double cushion on our chairs. I ate my meal without taking my eyes off the plate. From that day on, things changed between Alice and me. When we next met, we were a lot closer. The experience of finding ourselves facing each other, over the knee of our mother to be spanked formed a new bond. We had looked into each other's eyes, seen each other's tears, screamed, and prayed in unison as our backsides were heated up more and more. It was a memorable experience, and that day, a very special, exclusive, intimate, and complicit friendship was born between me and that girl. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors, and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, None of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. Dressed up for a smacked bottom. I don't remember all the events of this particular incident. Mom and I were getting ready to go out for the day to see Mom's best friend Tony and her daughter Linda, who was a year younger than me. Mom had told me this was going to be a dress-up event in which I would have to wear a dress shirt, bow tie, dress shorts, and jacket so she could show me off to everyone. I had taken my morning bath and was in the living room with Mom. Mom had just ironed my dress shirt and handed it to me to put on, as well as my shorts. I put the shorts on without any problem. Then I put the shirt on, it was very fancy and had long tails front and back. I didn't think it was an issue because mom would tuck them into my pants in a minute. I remember chatting with mom as she buttoned all the shirt buttons, helped me tuck in the tails then zipped me up. Mom finished by putting on my bow tie. 
I thought I was ready to go but then Mom noticed something wrong with my shorts. I thought they looked fine but Mom was a perfectionist and told me to take them off again, I think they weren't ironed to her expectations. I dropped them to the floor and she picked them up, placing them on the ironing board. Mom told me to get my dress jacket and shoes while she finished ironing my shorts. I really didn't want to wear the jacket and argued with her. Mom wasn't having any of it. She gave me the look and scolded me for arguing and talking back. I sensed that a sore bottom was imminent and I got it into my head that no way was I going to be spanked for this. I immediately ran into my own bedroom and hid in the closet. I was sitting on the closet floor when I heard mom come into my room. After a few minutes, she walked out again, and I naively thought that this had worked and mom wouldn't be able to find me. In reality, of course, she knew exactly where I was, and that my spanking could wait a few minutes while she went back to finish ironing my shorts. After a short while, mom came back into my room, my shorts in her hand. She opened the closet door and saw me sitting there on the floor. I looked up and gave her my best, puppy dog, look of mute appeal. All she said was, Eddie, come out now. There was no further place to run, so I had no choice but to obey her. Why are you hiding in the closet, she asked. Because I thought you were going to spank me, I replied. She neither confirmed nor denied this, but it was pretty plain to both of us that a spanking was firmly on the agenda for me. Mom sat down on the bed and told me to come closer. Eddie, you must never run away from Mommy again, do you understand? This would have been the right time for me to apologize properly but all I came out with was, okay. Mom looked at me for a few more seconds, as if thinking hard. I think she was concerned that if she put me across her lap, as she normally did to punish me, my shirt and bow tie would get all messed up, and she wouldn't have time to fix everything again before we had to leave. Eventually, she told me to turn away from her and face the closet. While I stood there, she put her left arm across my chest and slowly smacked my bottom five times over my shirt tail. This was unusual as mom usually gave me far more smacks, depending on the offence. Indeed, when I had been very naughty, I would be unable to keep count. I think mom must have really found this spanking position awkward, but there were no complaints from me. Finally, mom said, right, now get dressed unless you want a much harder spanking. I did as I was told, and by the time I was ready, I looked like her little Lord Fauntleroy. Mom combed my hair and took a good look at my hands to make sure they were clean. Then we left the house and got into the car. Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. If you are enjoying our stories, please do subscribe to this channel. We will be posting many more stories as time goes by. This story is about an incident that happened to my cousin Estelle, to this day, we are very close and she cringes every time I mention this to her. My parents never spanked me because of experiences my mother had in her own childhood. I was spanked in school, however, and my parents felt there was little they could do about it because corporal punishment was part of the school's rules. My mother's sister Leslie was quite the opposite. She was very strict with her two daughters, Estelle and Cheryl, and spanked them frequently. She would use either her hand or variety of implements, including a garden stick which served as a cane. The girls are both younger than me, Estelle by four and Cheryl six. I adored both of them, but was closer to Estelle, I suppose, because she was older. I would take Estelle to play quite frequently, and we always had a good time, but I would also take care to get her home at the time prescribed by Aunt Leslie. Besides just being strict with her daughters, Aunt Leslie would say things in front of other people just to humiliate them. At one time when we went to visit them, she said, Estelle had a sound spanking just before you got here so she should be on best behavior right, Estelle. Estelle blushed terribly, with tears welling in her eyes, but she knew better than to protest and meekly nodded. On other occasions, if the girls were in her opinion misbehaving, 
Aunt Leslie would ask them, now, which one of you would like to be spanked first later. She would openly discuss their corporal punishment with others, sometimes in graphic detail, and even threaten to show us the resultant marks on their bottoms, although she never did. If either girl protested at the topic of the conversation, it would evoke a retort describing precisely what they might expect at bedtime. One time, Cheryl protested so much that she was told to be kneeling on her bed at bedtime, with her bare bottom pointing up at the ceiling. It seemed like Aunt Leslie would do anything to increase the girl's humiliation. She had even taken them to the local garden shop for them to choose their own sticks, and let the man behind the counter know exactly what they were for. On a couple of occasions when we were there, I heard Cheryl being spanked in another room, her mother all the while telling her to keep still and stop struggling. Afterwards, while she was still sobbing and rubbing her bottom, Cheryl was made to come into the room where we were all sitting. However, despite all the humiliation she heaped upon her daughters, Aunt Leslie never had spanked them in front of anyone, until one particular day which I remember very clearly. It was hot and sunny, and Estelle, and I went to the local market, and then later we sat in the park, just chatting. Estelle was only twelve at the time, but she looked so pretty, she was wearing a tight pair of red hot pants that were the fashion of the day, and a white t-shirt. Her long hair was set in a bun and Aunt Leslie had allowed her a hint of makeup, she looked so mature for her years, in both her dress and her physique. For some reason I lost track of time, and suddenly realised we should have been home fifteen minutes earlier. I could see the sheer panic in Estelle's face when I told her, and I felt so guilty, and apologised. We began to run back, but we were a good fifteen minutes from home, and so there was no chance we wouldn't be at least half an hour late back. No words were exchanged between us on the way home, me because I just didn't know what say, and Estelle, because she was already fighting back tears. As we came up the path to her front door, Estelle took out her keys and nervously fumbled to get them into the lock. Cheryl must have seen us and opened the door, the expression on her face was a giveaway that Estelle was in big trouble. They seemed to mouth something to each other which I did not understand, but it caused Estelle to cry out to please, no. We followed Estelle into the lounge, and I saw Aunt Leslie sitting in her armchair. Then I noticed Estelle look over to the dining room table, and she let out a cry, please, mummy, no. I'm sorry. I didn't see the time, really. I looked over and saw the reason for my cousin's distress, the dining room chair was backed up to the table, and a menacing stick lay next to it. Her mother ignored her pleas and just pointed to the table, with a strict expression on her face. I interceded and explained to my aunt that it was my fault for not telling Estelle the time. She replied shortly that she was not interested in what I had to say, and that it had been up to Estelle to have asked me what the time was. Cheryl was vigorously shaking her head at me, and I understood she wanted me to be quiet for fear of making the situation even worse, if that was even possible. By now, Estelle had obeyed her mother, and was standing by the dining chair with her hands on her head, trying to hold back her tears. I felt really choked up, Estelle was such a sweet girl, and I couldn't bear to see what was about to happen to her. I made as if to leave the room, but Aunt Leslie told me in no uncertain terms to stay where I was. She told me, you have caused this, so I think it's only right you see the results of your thoughtlessness. I froze on the spot, my aunt was so authoritative, and again I was concerned about the effect on Estelle's punishment if I was defiant. I watched as Aunt Leslie walked over to her daughter, and put her hands on the waistband of her hot pants. At that point I looked away, not wanting to cause Estelle any more embarrassment than she was about to suffer. When I looked up again, Estelle had clambered onto the chair, and was leaning across the table with her head down, and arms stretched across. Her mother had totally bared her bottom, and it was now poking up over the back of the chair. My breath was taken away, Estelle's bottom was full, and so shapely, its pure whiteness contrasting against the slight tan on the back of her legs from the days of sunshine we were having. Although she had her face away from me, she was facing a mirror, and I could see the tears running down her face. Her mother began tapping the stick against her bottom, this seemed to be a sign to Estelle 
because she pushed her bottom out more but kept her legs tight together to try to preserve some modesty. There was a momentary wait, and then the sound of the stick swishing through the air. I saw Estelle crease up her facial expression, and then whack. The cane landed square across the top of her buttocks. The implement of chastisement seemed to sink into my cousin's skin, making a slight an indentation before springing back. Estelle let out an initial slight cry, which I suspect was mainly from shock, this was followed instantaneously by a much shriller scream, as the stinging sensation crept across her presented bottom. Her body jerked up, and she struggled to prevent herself from standing up. I should say that this was not the first time I had seen a girl caned, although they had been much younger than Estelle. And to be honest, I had also witnessed much harsher strokes than that. I had even experienced them myself on my bare bottom. I think Estelle was just more sensitive back there than many other children. There was a momentary pause, then her mother barked, well, Estelle. Estelle choked back the tears, and, barely audibly, said, one thank you, mummy. I had never witnessed this ritual before, the nearest I experienced was from one of my teachers who would count out the smacks herself a one and two and three while she spanked my bare bottom over her knee. Occasionally, some of the little girls at the front of the class would giggle and join in. Estelle pushed her bottom out again, but Aunt Leslie seemed to deliberately delay her next stroke in order to increase her daughter's stress. This caused Estelle to clench her cheeks in anticipation of what was to come. Then there was another swishing sound. The stick made its second indentation into my cousin's bottom, slightly below the previous stroke, causing her to cry out once more. Her face screwed up in agony, and once again she was struggling not to get up. There were now two distinct red stripes formed across both her cheeks, and she muttered between sobs, Two, thank you, mummy. Estelle gingerly pushed her bottom out, but before she could finish the third stroke crossed her bottom cheeks. In the mirror, I saw her her eyes opened wide in shock, it was as if she was trying to cry out but couldn't. Eventually, a loud scream emanated from her throat. She wriggled her bottom from side to side and now abandoned any remnants of modesty by parting her legs, clearly showing her vagina, in the vain hope it would ease the sting of this third stroke. She gasped for air and then whispered, Three, thank you, mummy. Aunt Leslie pressed her hand into the small of Estelle's back, forcing her bottom out and leaving nothing to the imagination with her legs now spread. It was clear that it was her mother's intention to cause the girl maximum humiliation. Finally, Aunt Leslie addressed her errant daughter, well, Estelle, three nice stripes on your bottom, and almost as red as your hot pants. What do you have to say for yourself? There was a pause whilst Estelle composed herself. Fighting back the tears, she took her and said, I am sorry for being a naughty girl, and thoroughly deserved to have my bottom caned. Her mother tapped the stick menacingly against her daughter's bum and asked, You're what caned, Estelle? The girl quickly replied, My bare bottom, mummy, my bare bottom. Thank you. Aunt Leslie prepared to give her daughter a fourth stroke. Estelle tried to close her legs again, but her mother said, Too late for that, young lady, everyone has seen everything you have there now anyway, so keep it like that. Estelle was left with no choice but to obey, and I noticed little trickles of wee running down the inside of her legs, and then beginning to drip faster from between her legs. Her mother must have noticed it too, and she told her daughter to get up, go to her room and stand in the corner with her hands on her head. Estelle hopped down and dashed past me, I averted my eyes. When she had gone, Aunt Leslie looked at me and said, well, young man, I hope you're sorry about all this. I nodded and left as quickly as I could, in case my aunt suddenly had the idea to cane me too. I was not allowed to see Estelle for two weeks after that incident, but when I did, she did not make me feel guilty about what had happened and actually said she hoped I hadn't been embarrassed at seeing her like that. You may be sure that when we next went out together, I made absolutely certain Estelle was a fine. <laughs>